and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No, because I'm going to get him. Folks, this is the Hagman and Hagman Report for Thursday, September 26, 2014. This is Sheila Zelensky filling in for Doug and Joe again tonight, folks. You're about to hear three hours of incredible programming. You're listening to the one and only show where the news is presented in 3D. We look well behind the headlines, the bylines, the fog of disinformation, misinformation, and misdirection to bring you the news behind the news, and it's amazing what you're not being told on the 6 o'clock news. The broadcast time is each and every weeknight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and on Saturday, our weekend report with yours truly. The home base is Hagman and Hagman.com, and please bookmark WeekendVigilante.com. And folks, just a reminder, our Wednesday call-in prayer line, please join me every Wednesday at 7 o'clock Pacific, or pardon me, that's 7 o'clock Eastern Time. I'm on Pacific, Doug's on Eastern, I always get that mixed up, but 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Folks, the details are there on Sheila's Ministry tab on the menu on my website. We will be fasting and praying that day and every Wednesday. I hope you join me in that. It's very important. And hello to our listeners around the globe, my co-host tonight. And, of course, this has been really fun because, of course, Dave Hodges, I nicknamed him the instigator of the airwaves years ago, and he has certainly lived up to the reputation you can find his handiwork at thecommonsenseshow.com. Dave and I have done a lot of shows together, and we research and cover topics that I really don't think anybody else touches with a 10-foot pole. He's a good friend to me. My fellow instigator, welcome tonight. Thank you for co-hosting. Hi, Sheila. It's good to be back with you again. It is very good to be back with you, Dave. This is going to be uh, really uh, the mother of all shows tonight. We're going to dive into the underbelly of some deep, dark things, the inner secrets of the Illuminati, Freemasonry, Satanism, magic and the occult, numbers and symbols, occult holidays, and other ominous things such as aliens, UFOs, and the Illuminati's plan for us. Tonight's guest is is certainly no stranger to the dark side. He was raised in a family that was in the Illuminati since 1789, and for 20 years he was trained and he attained the rank of Master Witch a third-level Illuminati witch. It was there he learned their insidious inner workings and secrets, and ever since 1979, when he became a born-again Christian, he's had a bullseye on his back. He's been shot at, stabbed, poisoned, threatened, and yet he continues to expose the dark lords that rule this planet and their maniacal plans. He now devotes his life to traveling across the globe to expose and educate the public on the occult, speaking at seminars, lectures, conventions, churches, universities, He's trained therapists, clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, state police, and FBI in the areas of satanic ritual abuse, solving occult crimes. He's appeared on and consulted for The Oprah Winfrey Show, Geraldo Rivera, 2020 Hard Copy, Inside Edition, Unsolved Mysteries. You've heard him on Coast to Coast, Prophecy in the News of Gary Sturman, Raiders News Network. I mean, I could go on and on all night. He's known as the man who can fill in the blanks. Doc Marquis, welcome to the program, sir. Sheila and Dave, how are you both doing? Very doing great. well. <laughs> Good. This is a bit unusual. Usually I ask how Doug and Joe are doing. Yes. Doug and Joe are well on their way to um, looking forward to their Monday night show. Doug's voice, I think, is getting a little bit better, so we want to be praying for him. So we're going to be getting into the underbelly of some very ominous things tonight. What I want to start out with here is sort of the topic, aliens, fallen angels, or antichrist, with a question mark, because that is one of the series, Doc, that you cover. And, you know, this is really interesting. There's a meme that I saw that was pretty funny, and it was Giorgio Tsoukalos, the star everybody knows of ancient aliens, with a trademark wild hair. And the caption is, I don't know what the question is, but the answer is definitely aliens. And you and I have joked, Doc, about these shows being the most annoying shows we never miss. (laughs) Exactly. He's really become kind of a minor pop culture icon. Remember the book, 
Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken. Well, Sukhalis is the director now of Daniken Center for Ancient Astronaut Research. They appear in the Travel Channel, the History Channel, the Sci-Fi Channel. There's a there's one that uh, Al Gore should be on. The Sci-Fi Channel is an actual channel. The National Geographic, they're doing series in search of aliens. They've been on Ancient Aliens, and now they're on a new series on Open Mind TV. There's a good one. Uh, well, here's what's not so funny. He spent the last five years really focusing on ancient astronaut theory. But here's a bizarre thing that he did, and I'm going somewhere with this. On one of the series, he was doing an ancient time traveler episode series, and it was about Nazi occult interests with so-called wonder weapons and time travel. And he opens a show claiming that some diabolical-minded Nazi scientists were brought to the U.S. after World War II in a project called Kronos the name for the titan god of time, or maybe the personification of time would would say it better. But he explains this Nazi-type time machine, and he goes on to link how aliens gave them their sinister knowledge. But here's what he did that I thought was very disturbing, Doc, and I'd like you to weigh in on this. He starts explicitly citing from a very anti-Semitic book banned in Europe, this eclectic mishmash of Sanskrit text and Tibetan text, and he starts quoting, of all people, Meta, you, good old Madame Blat, Blavatsky, the secret doctrines author, you know, the most loose-fearing woman in the universe. And then he starts right. quoting Manly P. Hall. What is this wild hair idiot doing quoting these two real sinister... I mean, th- Manly P. Hall wrote Secrets of All Ages, and as everybody knows, Helena Blavatsky, author of the you know very secret doctrine book, it's deep, deep, dark occult knowledge... Do you think this is ignorance, or is he aware of what he's doing? Because I don't think you go around quoting those kind of things unless you kind of know what you're doing. Well, something's going on here. When someone like George, I can't even remember his last name, and all his pals on that ancient alien show, you listen to them, mankind was a bunch of morons who couldn't do anything without the help of aliens. You know, and um, when I hear that he opened such a show with, you know, quoting from Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society and Manly P. Hall, who's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Masonic writers of the Masonic literature ever. When I think of the books he referenced and um, their teachings, some, someone knows something somewhere because those... Um, um, Manny P. Hall was in the Illuminati. This is information in the Illuminati that's common knowledge. And Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky um, had a direct link to the Dual Society, which was one of the three major occult societies in Nazi Germany. Those three being the Thor Society, the Brill, and, of course, the Illuminati, who were working through the Masonic Lodges. Now, That tells me he knows something, but he's not quite sure what it is. Well, um, do you find it interesting that Helena Blavatsky is the one that said, uh, isn't she the one that said Lucifer is the rightful god of this world? Yes. She said Lucifer is the rightful god of this world and that the god of the Bible is our enemy. So this tells me a lot as far as what is the mindset of George who would quote such a diabolical message. You know, it doesn't yeah, matter well, who's quoting such diabolical messages. The more I watch messages. the shows, the more I, I see different, shall we say, hints of occultism popping up. Right. And I'm not surprised because, again... When we look into the question as far as the origins of aliens, um, UFOs, um, the little grays, things of that nature, it all began back in Nazi Germany under the auspices of the Illuminati through one of their greatest puppets in all history, that being Adolf Hitler. Right. Well, there was some really hardcore... Nazi scientists, too, that obviously, you know, I said this on a show with Ellie Marzulli last Saturday. It's on record, Doc, that Werner von Braun, the card carrying Nazi rocket scientist, he admits they got the technology from, as I'll use his words, outside sources. 
And Project Paperclip is a real interesting project. And actually, Dave Hodges is kind of a little bit knowledgeable on that. Um, what is your take on this Operation Paperclip? Well, I knew a day. My father, uh, we believe, worked in that project, although they didn't call it Operation Paperclip. He had gone from uh, installing nukes on aircraft carriers to being early retired in the Navy at full pension, so he could go to work at Martin Marietta in Littleton, Colorado, which is now Lockheed Martin, and his clientele, German scientists with one Russian, and they were reverse engineering high-level craft, uh, basically lighter than aircraft that could uh, do vertical liftoffs and escape Earth's velocity. And that's what my dad was in charge of. And uh, he he never had a position on the alien influence, as Werner von Braun intimated. But he said the Germans believed it. He said, uh, I asked him, I said, do you really think they're aliens? And he said, you know, I can't say for sure. He said, but the people I worked with from Germany absolutely believed it. Wow, isn't that interesting? Yeah, jump in there, Doc, please. What's your? I want you to give our listeners a real good overview, and then we're going to spring into Michael Aquino. This huckster is really newsworthy as well. Well, Operation Paperclip, for those who don't know, was um, a secret project by the, um, the United States military um, in which they took, now this is the story, in which they took supposedly 100 Nazi scientists and brought them over to America. Well, it wasn't 100. The records clearly point out it was a little bit more than 2,000 hardcore Nazi criminals. They were scientists. But, um, and this is in DVD 9 and 10. I always put the proof. I show the evidence. If we go by the military records, um, people like Bernard Von Brown and a number of others by the United States records now, they were all labeled criminals. A number of them, um, and just to paraphrase this, um, basically um, in the instructions, shoot them on sight, arrest them, um, don't let them into the country, things like that. Yet, when Operation Paperclip came about and they were bringing these scientists over, if you look at the DVDs, 9 and 10, you will see the new military records that says, oh, there's no evidence that this guy ever had anything to do with this or that or blah, 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 let him in. And yet, these hardcore Nazis were given um, citizenship, um, passports, houses, um, cars, and a paycheck to work on what was known as Operation Paperclip. Now, Operation Paperclip was simply a continuance of what the Nazis had been doing in, um, under the Third um, Reich. They had actually been building, and again, I put in all the photos, the documents in DV9 and 10, so you could see the evidence of what I'm about to say. They were the ones responsible for building what we nowadays call UFO um, UFO flying crafts or alien ve vehicles or flying saucers, whatever you want to call them. And um, that's all we were doing. And it's from there that we really took a quantum leap as far as developing our own space program, which, as you well know, um, now is labeled NASA. Um, technically speaking, we didn't have an American space program. We had an, um, a Nazi one. <laughs> it was all because of these hardcore German scientists that were brought over under Operation Paperclip. Now, as far as Project Kronos goes, that was not American. That was German. You see, there was a particular flying saucer, or UFO if you want to call it. It was known as Daskalaka. The bell. Daskalaka from the German, and I know because I used to live in Germany myself for years. Um, um, means the bell. Yeah. Now, it really was a bell-shaped flying vehicle, and what's interesting about it is at the bottom of it, it was filled with liquid mercury. Now, um, anyone can tell you that um, liquid mercury, if sped up quick enough, it, pro it um, projects a, a huge electromagnetic field. Now, according to the theories of the documents, um, uh, the German documents, this vehicle 
was capable of not only incredible speeds, and according to um, Army newspapers, um, these vehicles that the Nazis had been creating were capable of flying up to 10,000 miles per hour now. And back then, our flat fastest flying vehicle, I believed, was just a bit over 600 miles an hour. And towards the end, when the Nazis um, were on the verge of utter defeat, I can't remember the name of the general in charge of the program, but the story goes he took one of the two um, flying vehicles, the um, Daskalaka, and escaped, and he's never been seen again. And interesting enough, a number of years later, there was a second Daskalaka um, that was found in America shortly after the Roswell incident. This one had crashed. So, um, wow. Well, let's start the, with the whole of it. Yeah. The whole of that project was um, supposed to have been called Kronos, because Kronos, according to Greek mythology, was one of the ancient titans, and he fathered the three main, um, three main gods of Greek mythology, that being Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Um, and um, Zeus became the head of the pantheon because, aside from his supposed gift of having the seven thunderbolts, he also inherited the gift of being able to control time by his father, Kronos. And since it was believed that um, um, the bell, or Daskalaka, it was believed it was capable of actually passing through time and space itself. Well, what's what's really fascinating about that is when you when I when I think of that, you know, this time traveling, I think of some of the information they give out of course all across the television on UFOs. But I want to start out with Kenneth Arnold. The, he was very reputable and really reputed aviator. He had thousands of hours of flying and, you know, sort of this infamous encounter with a it's been quoted even as 1,700-mile-an-hour flying saucer. I mean, they didn't have any kind of technologies back in the 40s, and that really did start a firestorm of controversy. And to paraphrase his own words, this is back in the 40s. They were not made on this planet, he said. I want you to really get into that because, I mean, UFOs have not just been a part of American history, but they've been part of different events in various forms and nations throughout the world, in petroglyphs and cave paintings. I want you, I mean, some dating back to 1700 B.C. So I want you to give everybody a real handle on the UFO issue. Well, Kenneth Arnold was a very reputed um, aviator, and um, his reputation was beyond question. Um, however, um, what people fail to realize when they consider the Kenneth Arnold story is that, among other things, Kenneth Arnold had seen these um, um, flying vehicles from a distance of 20 miles. He was 20 miles away um, when he had seen these flying discs um, flying over in near Mount Rainier in, in Washington. And um, according to him, um, they would have been flying somewhere around the speed you said because as an aviator, he, of course, he could measure um, how, how long it would take to go from point A to point B. And when he saw them flying from one mountain range to another, he was able to gauge their speed. Now, he did say accordingly that um, this was nothing he had known that we had and that they had to have been from out of space or something like that. But his statement was... Um, we couldn't have, he didn't know that we had done it. Well, that's true. He, he didn't know of anything that we had capable of flying at such speeds because this was top secret. This was back in, um, let me think, that was 47, um, what was that? Yeah, right around um, 1947 is when... Um, this incident had happened, and at that point, we had already been working on Project Paperclip for um, two years. What he had seen, and when, we, and when we take a comparison of what he had drawn, 
and compare it to um, known flying saucers that the German, the, under the Third Reich, had already con- cre- um, had, had created, it matches up. What Kenneth Arnold had seen was simply an extension of what the Nazis had been working on, but now it, will, it was in um, the United States military hands under Project Blue Book. Interesting. Well... We know that even the P-80, like there was only, I think, on record, a 647-mile-an-hour, uh, you know, jet propulsion system was about the max, and that's according yeah. to colonels on record. Mm-hmm. Yes, that, if I remember, it was just, um, yeah, it had to have been, because it was just below the, um, um, uh, what, what is that, the speed of sound, sound barrier. Yeah, jump in on that, Dave. Well, what, what I would like to address, uh, or have you address, is um, at the end of the war, we started suffering horrific losses with our B-17s because our protective fighter planes couldn't combat the jets that were in the air, and the technology they were displaying was a whole generation or greater even than what we had. And what I'm wondering, too, is why Germany did not deploy this technology as weapons and reverse the course of the war. Um, what weapons? Well, if they had things like a Nazi bell, if they had the ability to create craft that could travel 10,000 miles an hour, if they had the ability to develop weapon systems that were commensurate of the technology, do you think they would have made the American military crumble? Well, that's just it. You see, it, you would think that should have happened, and I agree with you. Had they actually gone full-blown with this, it would have. But something had happened. For some reason, Adolf Hitler did not go with this program. He put a complete axe on this project and instead went with the B-2 rockets. That's um, where he stopped the funding and went with the intercontinental, yeah, the intercontinental ballistic missiles. He thought that would be the way of bringing the rest of Europe and America down. Well, well if they would develop their uranium club to bring nuclear weapons into fruition, that would have been the way to go. But well, exactly, exactly. And this, again, is one of the mysteries about what had happened, because had he fully gone, I mean, just put all of Nazi Germany's efforts into um, uranium en- enrichment and developing the atomic bomb, which they were, and they were ahead of us at that time, I think the world right now would be speaking German. Well, what I what I would like to interject is, you know, think about this. At the time, you know, the G force for human pilots. I mean, they couldn't make turns like they, you know, you got to remember Kenneth Arnold was a very reputed aviator. He was known to be very reliable, very credible, a, a char- uh, you know, upstanding character. How do human pilots? You know, I think 6G is about the max. I mean, that is unbelievable that in the 1940s they had this kind of technology in these saucers. I mean, the Chicago Tribune called it saucers. The All the media at the time was calling it these thin disc saucers. It's um, incredible the kind of technology they had in the 40s. Yes, and you see, but um, as far as the G-Force factor goes, it's actually over 10. I think the max limit is 12 because they have these special suits that um, that they've made for the pilots that can withstand the G-Forces up to that limit. So it was 10 then? It was um, at least 10. I believe it's up to 12 now. But um, the whole mystery about this is, uh, is um, what Kendall Arnold had seen. And if we go by what he had drawn and compare it to what the Nazis had already built, it was simply um, a mistaken identity of what's known as the Horton Ho flying um, vehicle or flying saucer, whatever you want to call it. It's a dead ringer for it. 
Well, it was interesting that Phoenix, Arizona papers, and the, like I said, the Chicago Tribune, the uh, the Portland, Oregon Times, whatever that one, the Associated Press, they were really spinning this very interesting. They really, and then there was a lot of belief that they had a secret fleet of military vehicles that could actually go 1,700 miles an hour. This is back in 47, so it's just interesting that, you know, the FBI and the military were brushing this off. Well, yes, because they had to brush it off because of Operation um, um, Paperclip. They had to. Let's face it. Um, how many secrets? Does our government hold to this very day that they say, oh, this never happened? I mean, that's like trying to say that um, um, it was a YouTube video that caused the Benghazi incident. <laughs> well, well, here's a question that, of course, I got emailed in from a listener, is that apparently, now, I, I guess I wanted to get your take on this for the record. Do you believe that UFOs, or flying saucers. I mean, of course, we know there's all these flying objects around. I mean, it, I guess it's pretty apparent that you do believe this is a secret military experiment, really, and that the this is kind of a guise for people to believe there really is these little aliens running around, That the nice benevolent aliens, by the way. Yeah, wink, wink. Well, yes, of course it is. It's been, it's part of a 75-year-old plan that the Illuminati started back in um, the early 30s. And it's been going on ever since. It, um, as it says, it's 75 years old. And it was um, only a number of years ago that they finally had everything in place through the UFOs, through the so-called Little Grays, and all this other stuff, to where they can cover up the one and only one event that they fear more than anything else, and that being the rapture. The rapture, interesting. Well, of course, well, think about like this. Think, really, think about this. You're supposed to be the most powerful um, group of Luciferian witches on the face of the earth, millions of followers. You have um, countless um, money at your feet. You worship Lucifer. You're supposed to be the all-powerful people. <laughs> Yet, how do you explain the sudden vanishing of tens of millions of people around the world? How would you explain all the little babies in the nurseries and hospitals around the world who suddenly vanish. How do you explain away um, um, all the um, old people in the nursing homes and such? How do we explain all this away? What if um, you don't call it the rapture? What if you call it an alien visitation? Think about this for a second. What if one day the rapture hits? Lord dwelling, it'll it'll be short, it'll be shortly soon, and um, all that happens. Well, give it about a couple of days, maybe a week later, you're going to hear a worldwide announcement that NASA, through their telescopes, have seen alien flying saucers, motherships heading towards Earth. Well, give it about a, another week, maybe two weeks. Well, and, let's build, well, let's build really, a bit of a timeline, Doc, on UFO sightings, because one of the things that, of course, one of the Prussian that, that's begged here is, you know, we have cave paintings and petroglyphs that date back to 2700 B.C. and 1700 B.C., uh, 700 B.C. I mean, Mary was drawn with a really interesting picture at Mary at the tomb. There's ancient Indians in the southwest. There's there's so many different depictions of these flying disc-shaped objects that go back a long, long time. So how how would we springboard from your idea that well, you're building easy. into it's these? Well, it's easy. You see, if we look at the um, um, the real society um, of Nazi Germany, the real society was made up mainly of female psychics who claimed that they were in contact with um, superior beings in the Aldebaran system. And according to these beings um, who had been contacted by these ladies, supposedly through psychic powers now, um, they were instructed to go out into the world and find the clues that they left behind of their existence and that they had visited the earth. You see, the ultimate goal 
was to achieve space flight so that they could reach this advanced civilization in the Aldebaran system and prove themselves worthy to have this advanced technology. And this is why Adolf Hitler had ordered hundreds and hundreds of archaeological diggings around the world because they were looking for this so-called clues of these advanced beings left behind. And when they came across these certain um, petroglyphs, geoglyphs, ancient paintings, tapestries, and they saw so, um, what they thought were to be the so-called flying vehicles, the Nazi scientists then started building um, the UFOs after the similitude of what had been discovered through the archaeologists. A number of the vehicles um, they had built um, would have been like the um, the Brill Flying Saucer, the Hannibal Flying Saucer. Um, as I said, they had um, the Horton Who. They had um, lenticular flying vehicles. All these um, were shaped, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> were built and shaped after um, what supposedly the archaeologists were claiming were the missing clues from the Aldebaran system was, that was supposed to have been the advanced technology that they were looking for all along. Right. So what do you think the real crucial piece in all that is? I mean, you know, you've got this UFO battle clearly with, you know, I mean, it, this over Nuremberg, Germany, there's pictures from Hamburg. You've got a lot of these galactic UFO battles. You know, the French coin that looks like the saucer-shaped UFO that has the, I think it was printed around 1680. It's got opportunist at us um, with the 17th century pictures of, you know, the baptism and the crucifixion of Christ. There's UFOs in the background, you know, Windsor Castle, Japan. I could go on and on. What do you think the significance is of these UFO sightings, appearances? What did our ancient forefathers really see there? Well, I don't think that they had seen um, any sort of flying vehicles because if you look at enough of them, um, there's so many variations that it, it would be ridiculous to think that, what, 1,500 to 2,000 different alien civilizations had visited you know, Earth in the past. And that's an outrageous amount of number. No, I cannot accept, you know, simply because it doesn't make sense that that many civilizations had visited us in the past. Now, exactly what have they seen? The, um, some of them are so ancient, I don't think we'll ever know. But <laughs> when I consider, when I consider a lot of the um, photographic evidence, and I do mean photographic evidence, ladies and gentlemen. Again, it's in DVDs 9 and 10, um, where they show the so-called flying saucers. If these are supposed to be some sort of super advanced technological flying machines from an ancient advanced civilization hundreds and thousands of light years away from the Earth, why are they leaving fuselage trails behind them? Think well, about yeah, that. That's, that's, An that's airplane really cool. leaves fuselage or fuel trails. You see, you know, the white um, puffy smoke in the clouds. And this time I'm not talking about chemtrails. You know, <laughs> we're talking about something else here. The fuel that comes out of a jet, you know, or a plane um, forms white puffy trails. So, again, if, this, if these are those super advanced um, technological machines from way, way beyond, why are they leaving fuel trails? That doesn't make sense. Because if these vehicles, are, um, let, let's just say, let's just say if, the, if it's even one light year away from us, it is a matter at this point of what's known as mass ratio. The vehicle itself could not carry enough solid rocket propellant within its size to carry it even one light year. So it cannot be some sort of super advanced technological vehicle from way, way, way in outer space. No. It is a man-made flying vehicle. 
The evidence itself says that's fuselage. That cannot be a so-called alien flying vehicle. Well, it's interesting. So many people always talk about the Sumerian culture, the you know, the fallen angels, the I guess AKA demons. What's your take on the Anunnaki for the record for people? Well, okay. Um the Anunnaki myth came about because and I can't think of the person's name, who translate, translated the ancient Sumeria tablets or texts according to the way he saw it. He was not a scholar, he was not learned in the ancient linguistics of the Sumerians. Now, when you go um, to those who can read, write um, the ancient Sumerian language, they will tell you a different story. But if you go by what that guy had stated, he said that there was supposed to have been an ancient race known as the Anunnaki who lived on the 10th planet in our solar system known as Nibiru, and that Nibiru has such a gigantic elliptic course between us and the sun that we can't see it when it's at its furthest point, and that it does come um, closer up to the Earth every 3,600 years, and that on one of those cycles, the Anunnaki, um, when they got close enough to the Earth, um, got into their so-called flying saucers, landed on the Earth, enslaved mankind so that mankind could dig up all the gold that was needed so that the Anunnaki could take it, but turn back to Nibiru and clean up the planet and the atmosphere because um, it looks like they were in some sort of um, biological trouble themselves. And that because the Anunnaki decided um, man as he was was not good enough to turn into a slave race, they introduced uh, part of their DNA into mankind and that we supposedly developed into who and what we are now because of alien DNA. Interesting. Well, I just want to let our listeners know we are going to totally open up the phone lines as well. So uh, just if anybody's listening in later in the program, you can press one and, you know, go ahead and ask Doc to fill in the blank on pretty much any topic from the Illuminati to Satanism to Freemasonry to aliens, UFOs, you name it. Um, now, getting springboarding a little bit into the Illuminati, you just said in a really interesting statement, what really is the plan of the Illuminati for mankind? Well, the eventual goal, and it's been repeated throughout um, the existence of um, the Illuminati themselves, is to create what they call the Novus Ordo Seclorum, or translated from the Latin, the New World Order. Now, if we go by... Oh, about 30-something years ago, a lot of people think George Bush when he was standing in front of um, Congress and he was calling for a new world order. Well, they thought he came up with some sort of new catchphrase. And after him, um, it, was, um, prime, um, it was the Prime Minister of Great Britain who called for a new world order, then Pope John Paul II, then um, the Russian Premier. But... Um, for all those people who thought that this was some sort of new catchphrase, they're wrong. The um, the first one of the first people who ever called for a new world order would have been um, Adolf Hitler. But even then, we can go further back into other dictators of the Illuminati, such as Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, um, Mao Zedong, and, and others of those day and age who had. Um, were also calling for a new world order before Adolf Hitler. You see, this is, as I said, one of the seven major, um, well, the Illuminati has a seven-part plan in order to set up their new world order. And the seventh and, um, the seventh and the last part of their plan called for the creation of a new world order. This is where it all comes from, and these are the goals of the Illuminati. Well, let's springboard. So in the Dictators Illuminati, and by the way, I just wanted to tell you this, Doc, that um, I would really like to read this out. This It's a very good endorsement. Um, it, now, here it is. Absolutely brilliant. In Dictators Illuminati Part 13 in the Six to the Illuminati series, Doc Marquis does an outstanding and unparalleled job using the Illuminati seven-part plan as a backdrop to explain how world dictators, past and present, have been using 
or sorry, have been used to bring us to the point in history, like a seasoned trial lawyer presenting his case before a grand jury, Doc Markey methodically explains in compelling, convincing, and exquisite detail where we are in history, how we've arrived here, and what the future holds with the conspiracy of the Illuminati. If you want to understand real-world history, this scholarly presentation in both quality and substance is required viewing if you want to understand the big picture and the vastness of the conspiracy you never knew existed. The entire series is required viewing. This is by far the most informative presentation on this subject that I've ever viewed, and that comes from a multi-state licensed investigator <laughs> called Douglas Hagman. So you got a very, very nice, uh, obviously Oh, my nice goodness. Little... You know what? I've been waiting for Doug to um, um, send me that for ages. Well, and you got a really nice little uh, spiel from Gary Stuman and, and, you know, the boys over at Prophecy and the News, which excitingly are now moving over to Skywatch TV with Tom Horn. They really endorsed your work as well. Oh, that's very kind of them. So speaking of uh, the Illuminati and speaking of, of course, the dictators of the Illuminati, so in that series, really walk people through the importance of, you know, because people say, well, you know, Stalin... Mao Zedong, all these ruthless dictators throughout the ages, even springboarding into Hitler, you know, Mussolini, all these dictators. How does that? How is that relevant today of what we're seeing on the geopolitical stage today with Obama? Well, it goes back to what I tell everyone. If you want to understand the present, you have to go into the past so you can understand the future. In order to understand what's going on nowadays, and let me tell you, Sheila, I, ever since... Um, Obama had usurped the White House. For almost five and a half years now, people have been t- asking me what's going on. This makes no sense. Um, he's destroying America. You know, it, it, it seems completely topsy-turvy to them. But the thing is, it really makes perfect sense if you understand the inner workings and the plans of the Illuminati. Using that seven-part plan. Um, Stalin created, um, he's credited with um, started, you know, socialism, but some people would say communism in communist Russia. But that's not true. You compare the plans and the belief system of the Illuminati. All it is is communism by another word. Um, After him, it was... um, um, who am I thinking of? Um, um, Lenin, who actually, I should say, started supposedly socialism and communism in Russia. And then after him, it went to um, Stalin. But you see, um, Lenin was a socialist. Stalin was a communist. Mao Zedong um, was a communist. Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini were both fascists, and yet the seven-part plan of the Order of the Illuminati to create a new world order fits in perfectly with each of those governments. Now, if you bring that up to modern day under the present administration, um, and we're supposed to be a republic, not a democracy, ladies and gentlemen. The Constitution is still in force, and according to the Constitution, we are a republic. Um, that is being used absolutely perfectly once again in our system of government to where they are systematically destroying us piece by piece by piece. And interesting enough, for those of you who are, who are who have lived long enough, um, see, I was raised in the 50s. And I remember how different things were then and how people actually had faith and trust and our government back then compared to now. You see, the plans are still in force, and for anyone who doubts nothing's going on in America, let me, let me ask you this question. If you sincerely believe that there is absolutely no conspiracy going on here in America right now, let me ask this question. Why isn't there? With everything going on, why isn't there a conspiracy going on then? Well, conspiracy means two or more people are plotting something evil, so that's never happened, right? Wink, wink. 
Well, of course, you know, let's say Benghazi, let's say Fast and Furious. Um, oh my goodness! Let's just say what's going on at the you know the um, um, the border between the United States of America and Mexico right now. Um, let's say ISIS or ISIL, whichever one's going to make you feel fuzzy wuzzy when you go to bed at night, and um, all these other things. Well, Dave Hodges has covered a lot about Benghazi, Fast and Furious, and we just found out last night, didn't we, Dave? Good old Eric Holder is. Uh, just jumped off a politically sinking ship, which is really interesting. Dave, weigh in on that, and then I want to get your take on that too as well, Doc. Okay. Dave Hodges, are you still there? Dave. Well, go ahead, uh, Doc. What's your take on Eric Holder's uh, very... Well, isn't it interesting how now of all times he decides to jump ship because... Um, he was supposed to, um, I understand, um, well, from what I understand, he's supposed to still be there until right after the elections. And um, he's supposed to represent the highest um, law system, you know, in the United States. In other words, you just keep the law as is. You go by the law. And all he ever did was politicize his office and always in favor of whatever Barack Obama had viewed. Well, it was but actually kind of, Ob- oh, Doc, i got to throw this in. It was actually nauseating to watch how the media was spinning it yesterday. I watched, you know, I had hundreds of people emailing me things during the show, and it was just, it was nauseating to, to listen to that. It was, it was really quite hideous. Oh, I couldn't imagine, here. because that guy is just a slime bag, as far as I see it. He yeah. went after regular American citizens who had done nothing but... Um, he decided to harass them, just like the Internal Revenue Service decided to harass American citizens because they had their own political views that did not line up or agree with the agenda of the Obama administration. Yeah, Eric, the gun runner holder, isn't that just pathetic? Well, I know well, that... and uh, the thing is, let's face it, he's running, I think, right now because... Um, the, um, for the first time, the federal courts have ordered, this is actually ordered now, all the documents pertaining to Fast and Furious and the reasoning. They want to know why such and such was done, on what time, what was Eric Holder's involvement in all this, what was his reasoning and everything. It's been demanded. And um, um, heaven help. Um, whoever's there um, now, if they don't turn over those pages, because someone, if I'm reading um, the documents correctly, someone will end up in prison for contempt of court this time around. I mean, and let's consider how quickly Lois Lerner, you know, jumped the ship when she found out she was um, going to be um, oh, um, indicted by Congress. I mean, these people... It's interesting. Now that every now that the information's out and Congress is demanding answer, it's interesting how all these people are now scurrying about, as you said, as rats leaving a sinking ship because as far as I can tell at this point, they're all as guilty as can be. Well, Silk yeah, they're they're guilty all right. And speaking of complete unscrupulous charlatans, the three things that really give the Illuminati power is money, politics, and religion. That lines up with, you know, prophecy of revelations and others. Get into who are the front men of the Illuminati. Explain that to our listeners. Well, the front men, as I call them, were the six major front organizations started by the Illuminati to perpetuate their plans for a, a new world order. Now, the very first, if you want to call it, front organization of the Illuminati um, um, came right after World War I, and that's because at that point, the Earth became a much smaller place. Planes had been developed. Um, you no longer had to... Um, Go from one place to another, you know, from one continent to, to another, if, if you want, you know, just using steamship or not. And in order to keep up 
with what they knew was going to be a, a change in um, global society. The Illuminati started creating these um, international groups. The first one being the Royal Institute of International Affairs, um, which is located in, at Chatham House in England, in London. Um, shortly after that, um, what's become known as the sister organization was the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, then, of course, we have um, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the United Nations, and, um, oh, what's the other one I'm forgetting? So we've got the United Nations Council of Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, the Club of Rome, the Trilateral Commission, Chatham House. The Club House of Rome, to, that's it, right. All, Club of Rome, yeah. Now, if you compare all of their, um, if you want to call them teachings, and um, how all the members are interconnected, you will find out that the members, as I said, line up, they're interconnected, the teachings all line up, you know, with one, with one group is saying on this side of the world what this one is saying here, so on and so forth. And even more interesting, when the United Nations um, was created, I think we sent, I think it was 50 or 60-something representatives to represent the United States of America, and all of them came from the Council on Foreign Relations. Interesting. Isn't that an interesting connection, hey? Oh, yeah. Well, as I said, you can, I, again, if, if people would want to view that DVD, I believe that's DVD 3 in the series. It's called um, Front Men of the Illuminati. I will conclusively prove once and for all just what's going on with all those groups because they were all started by the Illuminati. They are still being funded using Illuminati money, and you will find out the vast majority of these people are all members of the Illuminati. Well, get into the Luciferian leaders of history for us. How back do we go? <laughs> as far as we want. I mean, let's look at any of the dictators. Most of them were um, either puppets or um, members of the Illuminati. So, Madam... Blavatsky, I'm sure, the secret doctor and Luciferian witch, I'm sure she uh, is in that. No, mix. she was not a member of the Illuminati. Oh, well, yeah, was, believe was it or not, she Luc wasn't. Well, then explain it the difference. Manly P. Hall the... was, but not uh, Madame Blavatsky. Well, explain she the difference. She was used then... by them, but that's, but that's it. Okay, well, then the difference between the Illuminati and the these Luciferians, explain that then. Well, um, the Illuminati are the Luciferians. You see, the form of religion of the Illuminati is known as Luciferian witchcraft. They worship Lucifer. Now, for a lot of people who may be new to the show or who have never heard this, according to the belief system of the Illuminati, um, Satan is just a boogeyman created by the Christians to keep the kids in line. It is believed by the um, people in the Illuminati that in the beginning, God was equal to um, Lucifer in all things. However, as the millenniums rolled by, it was Lucifer who became, uh, excuse me, it was God who became jealous of Lucifer's equality and had him and his followers thrown out of heaven. Right now, the Illuminati are convinced that they are summoning up enough of the force so that at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, they're going to kill God and the Holy Spirit and put Lucifer on the throne where they feel he rightfully belongs. And right now, Christ is supposed to be chained to a huge boulder in hell because he betrayed the cause. Wow, that really is the cold notes version, isn't it? Well, and again, I just want to remind people when we, in about seven minutes when we go to the top of the hour break, we're going to open up the phone lines wide open. And, of course, the number, as everyone knows, if you click on Weekend Vigilante, folks, Dot com. There's a the listen live button. It tells you the number for the show. There, it's a you got to dial one first. It's six six one two four four nine eight three nine. I believe that number is. Um, I just got uh, a little message at the studio. Is I think we lost Dave Hodges. Just so you know. Um, now I want you to talk about the how the entire Earth handed to the Antichrist through the occult. The biggest paradigm shift. I want you to get into that a little bit. Oh, okay. We've got how many minutes till the top of the hour? 
uh, till the top of the break. We have about six minutes, but we can come back and and continue okay, on. I'll, and you can I'll try to make this quick then. Well, no, um, you can have all the time you want to develop that idea. Okay, well, um, going by um, what the prophecies in the Bible states in Revelation 18.23b, it tells us that the entire world is going to be handed over to the Antichrist through the occult. Now, that means in order for that to happen, for the world, you know, literally to hand over, um, you know, for the um, occult to hand over everything over to the Antichrist, that means right now there has to be a um, measurable um, growth in the occult religions and indoctrinations and initiations greater now than in all of recorded human history. And if we go by the figures right now, in America, according to, I believe it was the Council of World Churches, um, there's approximately one million people that, that's being initiated into various occult groups in America right now every year. So we see a resurgence of the occult religion in a, a way that's never happened in all of history. But this came about only because of a plan the Illuminati had started back in the 60s. You see, the Illuminati had been trying to get their own people into the various branches of the United States Armed Forces, but, um, you know, and get them to recognize, you know, be recognized on the chaplain status, but, you know, whether that was the age of Aquarius or not, the military was not going to accept a witch, a Satanist, or who have you, you know, as a chaplain. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so... The Illuminati, they weren't going to be deterred from this. They, and this is where I came in also, you see, the, initi the Illuminati ordered literally thousands of us, and I was one of them, into the United States um, Armed Forces, <coughs> and we were to um, use a three-part plan as an attack. Um, this three-part plan basically... Um, um, the first part of that plan, any military base we were assigned to, we were to set up a fully operative coven. Second, um, whatever base, you know, we were at, we were to recruit key members of the military into those covens. This way, whatever they had access to, we now had access to. And the third and last part of that plan was to ensure that um, the um, the major occult religions would receive federal recognition and status. Now, if anyone wants to check the figures on this, you're, happy, you're more than happy to, because I believe it's a ninth, let me think, it should be the 1978 Army Chaplain's Handbook on Religious Requirements, um, in which um, it was listed for the very first time in military history. You now have witchcraft, Satanism, and other occult religions listed in the Army Champ Chaplain's Handbook. They have federal recognition and status, and they can't be touched by the law. Well, don't you find it fascinating that Michael Aquino was the head of the U.S. military psyops, and he was a self-proclaimed Satanist, and not only that, he really started the Temple of Set, didn't he? Well, yeah, but that's a different story. You see, Mike, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino was um, one of the top people in the First Church of Satan, which was started by Anton Zan de um, um, According to Aquino, he supposedly had a vision by um, Set, um, who he claims um, Satan comes from. You know, he believes it's from the Egyptian god known as Set that his that he says the Christian version of Satan came from. We know that's hogwash, but you know, we're talking Aquino now. <laughs> and Aquino um became the head of the military operation known as Psyops or Psychor. Right. And this is where they they've been developing new methods and such to brainwash and program people through. Um Aquino was um, also in major, major trouble at the Presidio base because, um, <coughs> excuse me, towards the end we find out that there was approximately 
um, 60 children that had identified him and his wife and certain other people on that military base that um, had been ritualistically, um, and I mean through the occult, abusing these children and using them for certain occult ceremonies, so on and so forth. Was that the Presidio well, base? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, and you have to understand that um, um, places like the Presidio have old um, nuclear bunkers and things like that that was built during, you know, World War II. So a lot of these bases have these underground places that you can do a lot of things in. <coughs> well, anyway. Well hold, well, hold that thought, Doc, because we're going to quickly, of course, go to a break. And don't go anywhere, folks, because we have a lot more to get into. And we're going to just, we have a wall of calls already. So we're going to take your phone calls just after the top of this hour. We'll get into lots more. It's going to be a great show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after the break. Hi, folks. It's Sheila Zielinski here, the Weekend Vigilante, to tell you about a very special offer just for the listeners of the Hagman & Hagman Report. I'm talking about our friends, our partners in our broadcast, American Survival Wholesale at americansurvivalwholesale.com. America Survival Wholesale is a Christian and veteran-owned company who supports our radio endeavors. They're our go-to company for all things survival, from full military-grade suits to all kinds of camping equipment, long-term food storage, and heck, even crossbows. As a special promotion to our listeners, America Survival Wholesale is offering a free Clean Sip brand water purifying drinking straw, a retail value of around $20, free on every order over $50. That's right, a free Clean Sip drinking straw on every order $50 or more. These clean straws are awesome, and what a great addition to any preparedness kit. And if you plan on ordering over $100, you can split your order and receive two free clean sip straws. Take advantage of this offer. Clean drinking water in emergency will be hard to come by. Be smart. Get as many of these straws as you can while you can. Put one with your preps, one in your car, your purse, your briefcase, your backpack, or your pocket with fluoride and big pharma runoff in the water and God knows what. Have one with you at all times. Each straw filters up to 200 gallons of water. We know time is running short, folks. So act now while supplies last. Visit americasurvivalwholesale.com and protect your loved ones today by being prepared. So right after tonight's broadcast, take advantage of this offer by visiting americasurvivalwholesale.com because if they don't have it, you don't need it. Folks, welcome back to Hour 2 of the Hagman and Hagman Report. I'm your host tonight, Sheila Zielinski, filling in for Doug and Joe. And what a program it is, folks. We have Doc Marquis on with us. And like I said, we're getting in the delving into the real underbelly of the dark world. It's things that go bump in the night and everything else. It really is one interesting show that we have tonight, folks. And I'm just going to open up the phone lines real soon. Doc, I want you to, though, um, this really interesting kind of springboarding into something different I found this fascinating that years and years ago, I think it was back in the early 80s, there was an Illuminati card set that circulated. It was grocery stores and everywhere else. And what was fascinating is there was a picture on one of these cards. Well, there's several pictures that are very insidious. But there's a picture of two towers and right in the exact pinpoint precision of where it would happen in 9-11, there was a a big cloud of smoke. I mean, it was so interesting. Do you remember this deck of cards? And if so, what was that all about? Oh, if anyone has listened to Doug and Joe's show for any time, they know I've covered this. But let's do this again for the new listeners just in case. 
I, it was back in 1982, between 1982 through 1995, um, there was a 13-year printing, and it's no accident that it was 13 years, of a seven-set um, deck of cards, seven different sets, and they were known as the Illuminati um, New World Order playing cards. Now, these were supposed to be um, to, shall we say, outsiders, uh, just regular, um, you know, playing cards like, you know, um, Magic the Gathering, um, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon, or, you know, things along that line. But what um, they didn't know, um, the outsiders, was those cards contain the actual plans of a number of future events the Illuminati had already designated was going to happen. Now, those cards were designed in such a way that only... Uh, members of the Illuminati would know what those plans would really consist of and what was going to happen. Um, among other things, and what you were just describing, Sheila, um, was um, um, the nine was nine eleven, where according to the cards, the twin towers would be hit. And if you look at the um, that card in particular. And um, I've got all these cards in DVD 1 and I think DVD 6. I, I, you know, I use quite a number of them. But um, the ones pertaining to 9-11, definitely in DVD 1, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, you will see um, by the card where the Twin Towers would be hit. And um, if we go by the photos of where the plane had hit, the actual Twin Tower, Tower 1, it was the exact spot as foreshadowed on that Illuminati card. Plus, the Pentagon, if we go by the Pentagon card in the Illuminati, um, the first edition, um, the Pentagon was also struck. And um, interesting enough, the, it doesn't explain in the card what hit it. And to this very day, no one, knows supposedly what hit it. Now, they say it's a plane, uh, you know, one of those, a 747 that was supposed to have hit it. Well, if anyone ever measured the wingspan of a 747, it's almost 200 feet long. Um, there was no 200-foot-long hole in the Pentagon building. Um, I have a number of friends who were reporters during that time. That was there shortly after... Um, um, the incident happened, and every single one of them had told me to this very day that there was no plane wreckage. Nothing. And if there was, supposedly, if it was done by a plane, where's the black box? <laughs> Where is that notorious black yeah. box? Well, you know, it's just so interesting that the tentacles of the the symbolism, the Kabbalah, I mean, the you know, the ancient patterns, the numbers, the letter, it's everywhere in our society. Risen this really dark, you know, practices. There's demon summoning all the time. These invocations. The, I mean, look at the, um, you know, I, I think about all these ceremonies, whether it's a, you know, a big football halftime show or whether it's the Olympics. It's always these really very ominous and very nefarious, you know, invocations and summoning demons. I mean, it's just so fascinating that stuff is woven into almost everything we see. I mean, look at the layout of Washington. I want you to get into that a little bit, and then I'm going to start taking some callers. And like I said, anybody that has questions tonight to Mr. Fill-in-the-Blanks, Doc Marquis, you will be able to ask whatever questions on your mind, folks. So we want to hear from you. It's your chance. So get into that for us, because numerology and the geometria, I mean, it's just very interesting how this all fits in together. Well, you see, the reason you see so much occult symbolism, um, numerological and um, geometric um, patterns is because the Illuminati always mark their territory. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, they will mark it. If it belongs to them, I guarantee you there's something there that will tell you it is, if you know what you're looking for. Going by what you just stated, well, um, um, the layout, the pattern of Washington, D.C. is made up of Illuminati and Masonic symbols. I'm talking about, um, I've taken 
just regular tourist map. And I mean, you could just walk down the streets of Washington, D.C. Street and buy the tourist maps I have um, purchased in the past. And I will show you exactly how Washington, D.C. is laid out using these um, Illuminati and Masonic occult symbols. Now, here's an interesting question for you. Um, oh, by the way, um, that section of Washington, D.C., um, between the Capitol and the White House, that's known as the Mall. That is, by all understanding, the most politically influential place in the world. Now, have you ever seen, Sheila, um, a surveyor's map? I have. I'm very familiar with surveyor's maps, yes. Right. And they're usually made up of oblongs or squares that says something like lot 88 or lot 127, you right. know, things like that. Um, well, that section of the mall, as I said, that's um, from the Capitol to the um, White House itself, that entire section, is lot 666. Interesting. Well, you know what's really fascinating is, uh, is it Kissinger or Rockefeller that just above in the little neon signs, what is his it's address? It's the Tishman what? Building. At oh. the Rockefeller Center, um, the Tishman Building. Um, unlike other buildings in Washington, D.C., I mean in um, New York City, I know because I lived in, Was in New York City for a while. Um, if, if you look at the buildings, most of the buildings will have the address either directly above the storefront door or on the side, the right-hand side of the building, and it's usually about 10 feet off the ground. Well, at the Rockefeller, section, um, um, the Rockefeller Center, there's an exception. It's known as the Tishman Building. If you look all the way up to the top, ladies and gentlemen, to, on the right-hand side, you will see in three bold red, and it's bold red because they're made up of neon lights, so you can see it at nighttime also, bold red, three numbers that are 666. She is not too in our face. Well, do you find it interesting that Walt Disney's new logo has really, I mean, this is not just my imagination. Is it my imagination, or do I clearly see three sixes in three their sixes. new logo? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely right. <laughs> and, but there is more symbolism in um, um, Disney movies and films than people realize. I did a whole presentation just on this alone for the for the Diné Baptist Church in Waterflow, New Mexico, and that's Curtis, that would be Pastor Curtis Harvey. And I'll tell you this much, those people were absolutely floored once they saw all the um, symbolism and such that I showed to the folks there um, that come straight from the Disney Studios. Well, it's, that's very fascinating, and there's such indoctrination for our kids. I mean, my son actually showed me an episode of SpongeBob where they had the all-seeing eye. They, Bart Simpson had the Twin Towers. It's in the you know, Looney Tunes. It's in Mickey Mouse. It's in everything nowadays. But anyway, we're going to open up and take some calls right now. Like I said, anything on your mind, ask Doc. So we're going to start with Area Code 304. Welcome to the program tonight. What is your question? Area code 304, you are live. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the Illuminati, uh, uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, are, uh, is that ancient bloodlines? And, and uh, by your understanding, where does bloodline come from? Okay, I better explain the origins. Okay, back in 1773... Um, there was a man known as Dr. Adam Weishaupt who was given the chair of the professorship um, of Jewish canon law at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria, Germany. Now, Weishaupt um, at the time was also a Jesuit priest, but the same year he became a um, he was given the chair of the professorship of Jewish canon law. Now, understand he was only 25 when this happened, and to become the head of any department, you usually are well in your 50s, if not 60s. But Weishaupt was one of those rare geniuses. You get once, once or twice in a generation, just like 
and um, in the last generation, we would have had, you know, like Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla. That would have been the two major geniuses of the last gen- generation. Well, Weishaupt was um, one of those um, rare geniuses. And this man could speak, read, and fluently write 12 different languages. And I'm not even counting the occult ones yet. And um, at the time, he was given the chair of the professorship. The Pope at the time, I want to say that was Pope Clement III, if I recall. He disbanded the Order of the Jesuits because there was three common... Um, complaints that was coming from all the monarchs throughout Europe. The three complaints were that um, the Jesuits were constantly interfering in the affairs of the of state, you know, whatever um, country that was. That if they were such, uh, if they were really a priestly class, how is it they have so much wealth? And third, the one thing that um, annoyed most of the monarchs back then was that. Um, The Jesuits answered to absolutely no one, not even the law of the land. They answered only and only to the Pope. Well, those monarchs had finally had it with um, the Jesuit order. And even before um, the Pope had issued um, this decree, which um, disbanded them, most of those nations had already started throwing the Jesuits out of their countries and said, don't return. Well, the Pope wasn't going to lose Catholic Europe back then, so he disbanded the um, Jesuit order, which means at the same time, Dr. Adam Weishaupt became a defrocked Jesuit priest. Well, he wasn't going to stand for it. Now, at the same time, in that year, 1773, um, a man known as Maya Amschel Bauer, who would later change his family's last name to Rothschild, had been watching and studying um, this educator. Um, One night, um, Weishaupt um, was invited over to Bauer's uh, mansion. And um, Maya Amschel had also invited at the same time 12 of his most financially influential uh, friends and basically told Weishaupt, and I'm just paraphrasing the whole of the event now, Basically, they told Weishaupt, we know you have the occult genius and knowledge to put it together. We've got the money. You do it. We'll back it. And so three years later, Weishaupt had done what no one in history had been able to do before. He, he actualized and created the order of the Illuminati. Now, this had been attempted before because you can trace the entire belief system of the order of the, of the, order of the Illuminati to ancient Babylon itself. But no one had been able to actualize it. And once it had, it's been around since its founding day, May 1st, 1776. So, I mean, I think it's very clear also that a lot of the mainstream media articles will put out that the Illuminati was really found in 1776, but it's really the Bavarian chapter, wasn't it? Well, they, some people will call it the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati because it was founded in Bavaria, Germany. But it's called the Order of the Illuminati, the proper name. It was called the um, um, the Perfectible, uh, uh, the Perfectibleist. Um, originally, but it was changed shortly thereafter into the Order of the Illuminati. Well, it's been said that the Rothschilds traced their lineage right back to <clears throat> Nimrodian times in antiquity, which is very fascinating. Okay, well, we got a wall of calls here. I'm going to take uh, area code 780. Welcome to the program tonight. What is your comment or question? Hi, Sheila, and hi, Doc. Doc, you are the encyclopedia of the Illuminati, and thank you so much for all your <laughs> dedicated work and your research. Love that. Listen, well, I only know what I know was because I was raised in it. Yes, and that's why you are the man. Hey, a quick question, and I'll, and I'll take it off air so everybody else can get on. As uh, Satan's goal is a one-world government, a one-world currency, and a one-world religion, can you explain to us how the current and future events will fulfill those agendas? Thank you very much. Oh, well, uh, well it's, it's very easily um, done. You see, how they're controlling the money was um, through the illegal system known as the Federal Reserve System. 
And this is the um, reason why Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. It wasn't assassinated because of his stance as far as freeing um, the slaves back then. It was because he was always blocking the Federal Reserve System from coming into America. Finally, um, once he became, um, you know, he was in his second term, they said, we've just got to get rid of this guy or we'll get nowhere. And that's exactly what they did. Um, they'll, they'll murder anyone who tries to stop the Federal Reserve System, no matter what country it is. And if you don't believe me, let's go um, um, up ahead of time, another 100 years, and see what they did to John F. Kennedy. He was assassinated for the same reason. He was actually going to put us back on the gold and silver. Standard, yeah. Um, they weren't going to allow it. You see, what, what, what most people don't realize is, um, let, let's use this example. It takes $10,000 to print $1 million bills, okay? And, mind you, um, um, this is not real money, per se, because nothing's backing it up. Yet, the Federal Reserve spent $10,000, and they just made a $990,000 profit by making illegal money, and we have to pay taxes on that illegal money. That's backed up by nothing. And it was the same reason why... And a lot of people may find this very difficult to um, un to understand or appreciate, but this is one of the reasons, the main reason, why 9-11 happened. You see, at the time, globally speaking, there was only seven countries left without a Rothschild-controlled central banking system. There was only seven. The rest of the world each had one of their banking systems, you know, the Federal Reserve. Those seven, now listen to this list very carefully. Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, North Korea, Libya, Cuba, and Sudan. Now, Sheila, what were the first major countries we attacked during 9-11? Well, I know like, when we go back to the petrodollar scheme and the Fed Reserve, I mean, you got this, you know, 100-year-old hen house covering the, you know, fox over the hen house. I mean, since the good old JP Luminary there crashed the Federal Stock Exchange, I mean, the very first one I can recall was them when Nixon, so Iraq, I think. Am I right? Um, well, when Bush um, at 9-11, right, went against Iraq, and, that, and then Afghanistan. Right. Now, Interesting enough, um, it was two years later, there was only five countries that only that did not have a Rothschild-controlled central banking system. And, to, and um, the two that had suddenly changed, going by exactly what you just said, was Iraq and Afghanistan. Funny, they suddenly had Rothschild banking systems. Um, so that left us Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. Well, interesting that if we were to go by um, today's date, there's only three more countries left in the world that do not have a Rothschild-controlled central banking system. Right on. Um, that would be Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. You now, isn't it. it interesting how North Korea, um, under... Well, when it was under Kim Jong Il, and now his what, what is that? His nephew or his grandson? Right. You know, um, the wannabe ruler. <laughs> how they're making a lot of saber rattling, just as I warned everyone back in 2003 that um, you're going to hear a lot of saber rattling from North Korea, and I told them watch out for Iran. And I also warned them that Cuba it will probably be in the last three because of um, back then it was still under the control of Fidel Castro. But now, if you notice, um, since 9-11, there's only three left. You see, 9-11 was not about um, a bunch of um, crazy jihadists. It was about the money. As I told everyone, you had to follow the money trail. And again, 
look at all the um, final nations that we've attacked now, Iraq and Afghanistan, the first two that now have a Federal Reserve System, and the others are going to fall in line the same way those other two had. Wow. Well, and that would also probably explain in two, was it 214? I, uh, the biggest bill that ever was passed into law, the entire G20 signed on to the bail-in. I couldn't believe that, you know, essentially making bank deposits, you know, you know, they could be used to capitalize the banks. You're no longer a depositor anymore. You'd be a non-secured creditor, a shareholder, you know, getting back pennies on the dollar. That's amazing that they could do, you know, with the Dodd-Frank, with Bretton Woods. You think of why did the big six, the biggest six banks spend $30 billion to pass that law? You know, it's just absolutely the Ponzi scheme well, 30, on steroids. I mean, 30, billion, $30 billion is an astronomical number for you and I, but for them it's nothing. Because going with what your caller had originally asked, if we go by the processes in the book of Revelation and certain other places throughout the Bible... This world is going to end up under a one-world um, financial system, under a one-world religion, under a one-world new world dictator. Now, um, between, and I still remember the timelines. You see, the Illuminati have a number of timelines in, when, in which certain events are supposed to occur. And there's quite a number of different timelines, some of them uh, over 100 years in length. But going by um, one of the timelines that I still remember, um, between the year 20, let me think, um, it's 2018 through 2022, the Illuminati uh, plan um, on causing a major financial disaster in one of the um, countries of the world. Now, back then, I saw this back in 1970. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and they didn't choose which country they were going to use yet. But they still had written down that they were going to cause a major financial disaster in, in one of those chosen countries. And it was going to be such a devastating financial disaster that it would force, finally force the nations of the world to come together and sit down for the first time in history and seriously start considering putting the world under a one-world um, universal currency. Yes. Well, let's start taking some calls because <laughs> we. I'm telling you, when I say a wall of calls, I mean a wall of calls. Area code 240, welcome to the program. What is your question? Hi. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Very good. Fine. How are you okay. doing? Good, good. Um, I What's have, your name, I have a question. My name's um, Tamara. Hi, Tamara. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you. This this show is, is great. Um, I have a question about Freemasonry. Um, mm -hmm. So when um, someone joins the Freemasons, and I'm shocked when Christians join, there's a book, from what I understand, that they write their spouses and children's name in. So I was just wondering, because I, I know a Christian who's in that, what kind of authority does that give Satan over the names of those people in that book? What's what's the impact? Is it in generational? It's some, and I don't know if this is correct, but I was told that when the, when someone becomes a Freemason, that they write their name of their spouse and their children in a book, um, in, a, in a Freemason book, um, well, yes, they do. I know what you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, what was it? It was back in the night. The hold on. Uh, the early 1990s, when the uh, Southern Baptist Convention had addressed the um, issue as to whether or not a Mason, um, whether or not a Christian can become a Mason one way or another. Well, they assigned a man to the task to study it for three months. Well, what the Southern Baptist Convention didn't know at the time was the man who they assigned was a person who was joining the Masons. So you were not going to get a negative response from this person. He was biased. And because of that, the Southern Baptist Convention's final ruling was, uh, well, you're going to have to make up your mind for yourself. I mean, I was positively livid at the time. Um, um, if you want, Tamara, 
Um, go to my website. It's um, Now, this is all lowercase, no apostrophes, okay? It's one long word. Put in www. It's a God Thing Productions 777.com. What you want to do is open up the DVD section. You'll see the taskbar on the left-hand side of the front page. Look for the DVD called um, Magic, Mysticism, and Masonry. That DVD, now I will warn you, it's two DVDs. It's almost four hours long. But I can conclusively prove how the Masons, among other things, and I use more than a hundred Masonic books that's in my own library, and I have their coded ones, mind you, in which they clearly state that they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ, that the name of Jesus Christ means nothing to them, and that if the name of Jesus Christ is ever brought up during any of their ceremonies or rituals, the person is supposed to be taken out and killed. Wow, isn't that interesting? Um, yeah. <laughs> Should a Christian become a Mason? Oh, people, I've got thousands of reasons why not. <laughs> and yet, the Southern Baptist Convention had the audacity to say, well, you're just going to have to make up your own mind. You know, those people are put there so that they can, you know, supposedly um, send down their knowledge from their white pillared towers, and the best they could give us was, you're going to have to make up your minds for themselves. How dare they? Well, we're going to take another caller. That's a great question by Tamara. And uh, do, actually, that's a great, very good segue. I was going to say to everyone, go to It's a God Thing Productions 777.com. And I'm going to tell you, I can speak personally on this. There is information in there that is just absolutely mind-numbing. And it's, it's incredible. The stuff that you have covered, the absolute explicit information you have documents you just did you just say did i hear you correctly doc you have a big library with volumes of freemasonry books um oh, that's saying, just on the masonic book yes i have hundreds of masonic books i have the coded ones i have books from some of the greatest writers you know like manly p hall um um albert pike who was um the head of the southern jurisdiction of all masonry um, as I said, I have the coded ones. I have more Masonic books. I'd have to sit down and actually count them all to give you so I could know exactly how well, many I have. Speaking of Albert Pike, let me ask you, why did the United States Congress back in April of 1898 authorize this private organization to place the statue of Albert Pike in public land on, in the U.S.? I mean, it is absolutely mind-blowing. You know, he's a leader of the Freemasons in the southern states, I, I don't understand why they would ever put a statue in recognition of him in the United States, period. Well, because he was also a mace, I mean, um, a member of the Illuminati. And mind you, his was the only statue at the time that was not, you know, um, um, a member of the government or the president. It was the only one that had absolutely nothing to do with the United States per se. The story goes, well, he was, you know, um, a, a general in the Southern Army. Uh, yeah, but didn't they lose? <laughs> okay, back to the phone lines. Area code 253, what is your question or comment okay, tonight? Okay, back to the phone lines. Area code 253. Uh, do you want to turn down your radio, please? Oh, okay. There you go. Hi, Sheila. Hi. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Doc. Hi, Doc. Hey, how you doing? This is Jack Groning from Lakewood, Washington. Hey, how you guys doing? Listen, hey Doc, you was you was talking about that. Uh, you were explaining how the New World Order was gonna, uh, how they were gonna uh, explain the rapture, and you didn't get to oh, finish yes. that. Oh yes. Okay, I, let me let gonna, me finish I'll that. Take, I'll okay. take my answer off the line. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate. It. Okay, thank you, Jack. So you see. How do the Illuminati, if they're so all-powerful and all this, explain the setting, vanishing, let's say, of, let's say, 250 million um, people and children around the world? Well, let's get back to what I was saying. What if, a couple of days later or a week later, um, NASA makes a worldwide, worldwide announcement and says that they have spotted motherships 
in outer space that's headed towards planet Earth. Well, give it a week, two weeks later, um, another global announcement says that these motherships are now circumnavigating the world. And to prove it, they show these wonderful um, photos or such um, CGI's on the television. And to convince the public that this is absolutely true, well, those flying saucers that they've been working on and perfecting since Nazi Germany, they begin to start landing at various capitals and important places around the world. And these so-called little gray aliens, with, which are nothing but um, bioengineered creatures that the Illuminati finally was able to perfect using um, um, when they, I should say, um, resequenced the double helix code. They finally broke that during the mid-'80s. Um, and these little gray aliens step out of these ships, and they say, well, all those people um, that um, vanished, we took them up into our motherships because they needed re-education. You people are the truly enlightened individuals who will help guide and steer all of you into the golden age of humanity. And it's going to work flawlessly because it plays upon the human ego. Remember, they're going to say, you people are the chosen one. You're the enlightened ones. You're the ones that are going to help us super advanced beings steer man into the golden age of humanity. Well, and I guess that could really explain why the Pope seems to be taking such a recent fascination with the fact that they're going to be baptizing aliens, and, you know, that's all you hear now out of the Vatican is how they're going to be embracing yes. yes, and aliens. Isn't, it, isn't it interesting that their telescope is called Lucifer? Yeah, I was just going to say that I actually took the words out of my mouth. Well, 928, back to the phone lines, area code 928, welcome to the program. What is your question or comment tonight? Uh, hi, Sheila. Hi, Doc. I have a question. I'm calling from Arno, Maine. And I have a question is, why is it that Satan and his uh, fallen angels hate mankind so much? Um, one word, jealousy. You see, remember, angels, just like um, Satan, Michael, Gabriel, or any of the others, were created to serve God. Human beings, we were created to love God and for God to love us. You see, it's, it's an interesting fact, hon, that when we look at the scriptures, <coughs> does it not say in the Bible that we were created in the image of God? It does Hello? say that. Yeah, okay. it does say that. Now, there's more to that than people realize. You see... <coughs> The reason um, you and I, Sheila, we can feel love, we can feel jealousy, we can feel anger, is because God felt them first. Right. Does God not say, I am a jealous God? Do we not find out that um, God is also an angry God, that he is a loving father and all these other emotions? Do we not know that his physical incarnation, Jesus Christ, is exactly as we are. Now, we have all these things, including our physical human construct, because God had them first. We were made in His image, both physically, spiritually, and with the soul, because He had all of these things before us. That is a really great, uh, that's a great response, and thank you for the question, caller. Area code 267, welcome tonight to the program. What is your question for Doc? Okay, is, do we have a caller there? Hello? Okay, <laughs> I well... I he went the way of Dave. <laughs> he went the way of Dave. Okay, area code 406, welcome to the program tonight. What is your question, sir or madam? Area code 406, you're live. Well, that's crickets chirping. I don't know what is going on here tonight. Okay. Well, a lot Area of people code. don't. Um, a lot of people don't wait. <laughs> they don't wait. 
Area code oh, yeah. 916. What is your question for Doc tonight? Hi, guys. Uh, Hi. My question is, is oh, we about have a response. the... Uh, Yay. Yay, a response. Thanks, 916. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> in the name of uh, King Jesus, we just thank you, Sheila and, and Doc. Uh, this is Lars from uh, the uh, fire zone of uh, Northern California. I've got a question for Doc about... Well, you know, the hand of God protected our community. It was a miraculous miracle that no homes were lost in the the area here, but uh, we did, unfortunately, down Canyon lost, uh, I think, about 10 or 15 homes. But uh, Uh, we came out of the church service on the uh, 14th, and the message was Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. So we came out... Oh, you know, I got a picture of this. Yeah, I got a picture of the smoke above the uh, above the church, and then when I got to my house, they were evacuating. But anyway, with all that being said, everything is great. God is awesome. He's on the throne, and uh, and His wrath Amen. is on the land. Praise God. Amen. Um, the the question is about ISIL and Levant. Is Levant tied into Leviathan? And just one other quick thing, um, the Lord's been showing me about the principalities, powers, rulers, and the high wicked places, and and I kind of put it in this perspective. The Antichrist spirit, Lucifer, the uh, Leviathan uh, uh, dragon, seven heads, and uh, the king of Babylon systems are coming to an end. And uh, I'll just take it off air. Okay, well, we know that the Babylonian system is coming back. Now, a lot of people, um, let me explain this. Um, When we go by the book of Revelation, we find that the Babylonian system, in this case, that's talking about the spiritual condition. In other words, what was the condition of Babylon way back when? Well, it was from Babylon that the very first religion on the earth was ever created. That religion is known as witchcraft. It was created through Nimrod and his mother, Semiramis. And this was the first system um, that um, actually proclaimed that there was other gods and that they should be worshipped and not the one and only true god. Well, that system, according to um, the book of Revelation, is coming back, and I think anyone with half a brain could see that's coming back. Um, As far as um, um, Leviathan having seven heads, no, 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 that's something completely different. Um, The the Leviathan that was mentioned in um, the book of Job, um, we know it could have been either a giant um, whale, which, well, giants are big, I mean, um, whales are big anyways, but either um, a whale or um, what some believe was a great white shark. Now, in either case, either one could actually swallow an, a human being whole, and if we go back to the description of Jonah, when he was finally, I hate to say this, but he was thrown up you know, by whatever it was that kept him. He came out bleach white. Well, that's an interesting description, which only validates the story because medically speaking, and I can tell you from my medical background, that the amino acids and such that um, that make the bile in most organic systems, you know, animals, whatever you want to, um, um, have a corrosive effect. And, you know, that's, you know, of course, to help with the digestive system. But it would also explain why Jonah came out of the well or the shock bleached white. So, um, as far as the Leviathan goes, that's what um, the Bible was talking about. Now, when we go to the book of Revelation, which is chapter 13, picking it up in verse 1, where we find the seven-headed beast, well, that represents... um, the um the seven um 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 great lands of the world and there's ten crowns um and ten horns which represents um the future ten um kingdoms of the world. The world is gonna be divided into ten super nations or ten kingdoms and the horns represent those who are gonna be the kings of the nation. That's what you're um um referencing there. Okay, well, I've got a question from uh, emailed in from a listener, Doc. What is your take? What is your take on the great deception to put the Antichrist in power? Well, the great deception right now is um, 
found in two in two basic systems. Well, actually three, but I'll break it down. One is um, that there is no God, um, but there are but there are um, aliens and UFOs. The second, um, again, there is no God, but there is a cult religion, you know. And um, the third one is there is God, but there is our version of God. And when I say that, I'm talking about those spiritually wicked brothers and sisters of ours, if they are saved to begin with, who are mixing occult religions with Christianity, such as the um, the Kundalini movement, the Prosperity movement, um, and all those other movements that have absolutely nothing with biblical Christianity. It's those things that um, is actually bringing on the great deception that we were warned about in the Bible. And it warns us that um, it could deceive Christians if it was allowed to. Now, that's depending upon the individual if they allow it to. You see, Revelation chapter 3 tells us that you and I right now are living in the um, seventh and final church age known as Laodicea. Laodicea is going to be made up mainly of born again children of God who are absolutely yeah, who are absolutely lukewarm. In other words, they're fence walkers. They won't commit to the left or to the right. And because of that, Christ said, "I will spit you out of your mouth because you are no good to me. I can't use you." Okay, we now, have another what? question. Oh, sorry, I just want to jump in here after you're done. When you finish that okay, thought, let me know. We have a ton of people. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, one of the questions, actually, this is actually four questions. I'll roll it into one, uh, pretty much the same theme. Is Prince William the Antichrist, and can you distinguish between the Antichrist, the false beast, and the, the uh, yeah, the Antichrist, the false, I don't know what this prophet. person's typed are. Well, anyway, false can you distinguish between the Antichrist, the, the false beast. prophet? And the beast, yes. Okay. <coughs> well, no, Prince William is not the Antichrist, simply because there are identifying marks throughout the scriptures that tell us who the Antichrist is going to be. Now, we won't know the person by name, but we are given um, certain things to look for. One of them is, whoever this is going to be, and this is in the book of Daniel, um, I believe it's chapter 11, we'll find out that the person is of Jewish heritage. Now, that doesn't mean he's practicing um, Judaism, but he does come from Jewish stock. Second, he's going to be a male. Third, he's going to be a virgin. Fourth, and this is what's interesting, he um, and um, and um, um, the Book of Revelation corroborates this part also. Um, he's going to pretend to be religious, but he is not. He is of Satan. In other words. He is secretly worshiping Satan. And one other qualifying mark, it seems whoever this person is going to be is going to arise from one of the ten common market European nations and literally have an overnight meteoric rise in the political realm because this person, whoever he is, is seemingly going to have all the answers to all the problems. That's the person you're looking for. Okay, excellent. That is very good And I don't think, and uh, just using common sense here, I don't think Prince William fits into any of that because, A, he's not a virgin. B, you know, he's not Jewish by my understanding. He he would have been from the Germanic branch. Well, the 12 tribes of Israel were assuming the book, you know, the 12 tribes, he would have been from one of those... Twelve tribes would he have not? Um, well, okay, this is where we get into <coughs> um, rabbinical understanding or the teachings of the rabbis. You see, one of the original tribes, and I believe it was Manasseh, was cut off from the original twelve tribe because of some horrific sin they did and was replaced. Now, it is believed by these rabbis that the Antichrist is going to come from um, that um, tribe. And as I says, I believe, if I remember, it was Manasseh. 
Okay, interesting. Well, that really yeah. explains some things. Okay, well, let's jump back to the phone lines. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, area code 907. Welcome to the program. 907, you're on the air. Hello? Hi, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, my question is for uh, Doc. So uh, it was nice that you brought the uh, origins of the Illuminati through Adam Weishaupt. Can you please explain how the Jesuits started and what their ultimate goal was and why that occurred? Okay, well, the order of the Jesuits started back in um, the 14th century under Ignatius de Loyola. And um, in the order of the Jesuits, there's supposed to be an individual who's supposed to be the head of this, and he's known as a black general. Now, a lot of people refer to him as the black pope, but that's a misnomer. He's really properly known as the black general. Now, their goal... Um, ev- um, ev- now, let, let me back up a little. Um, during the mid-1850s, um, the Illuminati finally had absolute control over the Vatican itself. Ever since that time, and this includes the Jesuits now, um, ever since the 1850s, the Illuminati has had one of their p- uh, persons um, in the Vatican at all times under the guise of um, a priest. Now, this individual is known as the Black Pope. Now, he's referred to as a Black Pope not because of his skin color or the color of the robes he wears. It's because he's always in the shadows. It's this individual who receives their, his orders and passes them on to the Pope from the Illuminati every single day. And it's been like that since the 1850s. And this is one of the reasons why the popes are following the Illuminati seven-part plan towards the creation of the New World Order because one of those plans of the Illuminati calls for the abolition of all religions and to unify the world under a one-world occult system. This is what's going on and why the Pope is trying to unify the world under a one-world religion. If you notice, they no longer say we want a one-world Catholic system. No, they're simply calling for a one-world religion. And there's a big difference between both terminologies. And if you understand it, you know that that world system they're talking about is um, comes from, I should say, the order of the Illuminati itself. Okay, well, I'm going to ask a question, of another email, or, uh, email question. Is Kenneth Copeland, and, okay, what is this? Is Kenneth Copeland a Freemason, and is Billy Graham, was Billy Graham a Freemason? I'm combining a couple into one question. Okay, I'm not sure with Kenneth Copeland, but um, Billy Graham at one time, from what I've seen, was a Mason. Now, if he became Mason, it was I. It could have been when he was a young minister, and that would have put it back in. Okay, let me think. Billy Graham. He's that old. Should have back there. Would have been around the 1950s. And back then, there was little to nothing known, shall we say, publicly about the uh, Mason. Now, <coughs> what's interesting about the teachings of the Mason, is that they claim they can take a good man and make him better. Oh, that one alone makes me just want to, you know, take Masonic heads and bash them together. Because they have the audacity to say that they can take a good man, let's say a born again Christian, and make him better. I think not. The only way that's going to happen is through God Almighty and through the person obeying God Almighty. Those people, as I said, if you look at their... Teachings, as I said, DVD four, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you do. You know what? Let me tell you something. I just remember something, Sheila. <laughs> when I um, wrote this series, the secret, um, the series that's called Secrets of the Illuminati, um, I didn't know, and I had no plans or thoughts for this to happen. People have been using DVD four, Magic, Mysticism, and Masonry, as just an other. DVDs in that series, right. and they're using them. They've been using them as witnessing tools, and literally speaking, 
if the half of what I've been told is true, literally speaking, thousands of Masons over the years, ever since DVD-4 was created, have been signing their letter of resignation and leaving the Masons, period. Interesting. Well, back to the callers. Area code 304, welcome to the program tonight. What's your question for Doc? Hey. Hey. Welcome. Welcome. Ask your question. Are you there? Oh, okay. Um, I'm still here. Yeah, yes. great. Hi, hi, Doc. Hi, Sheila. Um, yeah, my question is, you, you were on uh, on the show a while back uh, talking about Easter, and at um, the end of the yeah. show... I mean, uh, you mean on Doug and Joe, Hagman and Hagman yeah. report? Yes. yes. Yes, sir. Um, and at the end of the show, uh, I think Doug asked you a question, how far does this go back? And you said 1776. Um, right. So my question was, when the De- Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, uh, there was a constitutional convention in 1782, I think it was, and the symbol for that convention was the the pyramid on the $1 bill from what I've researched. Correct. So everyone who signed the Declaration of Independence, as far as I know, the only person that was at that constitutional convention that signed the Declaration of Independence was one person from Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not sure what happened to everybody else, but most of them were killed. Is that... Um, that Well, no. You see, of the 56 original signers of the Declaration of Independence... 53 of them were Masons. And um, um, co- um, Congress had ratified and accepted the Constitution, I believe, finally, it was in 1789, when they um, also um, um, assigned the two great seals of the United States of America. Now, the seal you're talking about, the Great Pyramid, now, according, um, going by the law of the land, it's the Secretary of Defense who's supposed to hold onto the two great seals of the United States of America. Now, interesting enough, um, um, every single um, treaty, um, tariff, <coughs> executive order, um, congressional bill, etc., etc., <clears throat> by law, must bear both those seals if the document is legal. Well, there's no such document in all of American history, that bear both those seals because the one with the eagle, um, um, with the breastplate holding the 13 arrows and thirteen uh, and the 13 leaf um, olive branch, that's been cast. That's a die. The other one doesn't exist because it's never been cast. It's never been made. Yet, when I was in the Order of the Illuminati, I saw both those seals on quite a number of Illuminati documents. You see, the long and short of it is, and again, this is on DVD 1. It's called The Arrival of the Antichrist. Those are not the two seals of the United States of America. Those are the two seals of the Order of the Illuminati. Now, since you've done your homework, you would have recognized um, that the seal that was first drafted and used in 1782, it was not an eagle. It was a phoenix bird. Out of the ashes arises what, hey? <laughs> you know, and those have never been the two seals of the United States of America. They have always been the seal of the Order of the Illuminati, and I proved it on DVD-1. There's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. The only time um, people ever saw those seals, and the first time, was back in 33. 1933, when, you know, we, you know, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, and you finally saw it on the back of the dollar bill. You never saw it before that, and I guarantee you, you'll never see it on any, any legal document in America, because only one, um, one part of that two, um, um, cast die exists, and that's the one with the, um, eagle. I've challenged people for over 36 years to come up with one legal United States document that bear both those seals. Never once has anyone ever come up with anything because there's no such thing as a legal document in America that does um, have both those seals. You'll see in the order of the Illuminati, 
but not in any American document. Okay, well, hopefully that actually answers about six emails I got as well. Hopefully, if you have any other questions, email me. 603, area code, welcome tonight. Ask Doc your question. Hi, Doc and Sheila. Thank you very much. You're such a blessing. Thank Um, you. Doc, Doc, I have a four-year-old grandson who I homeschool a Christian curriculum, and 50% of the time he lives in a home where a 16-year-old aunt is um, brainwashing him and trying to take away, say, Jesus is bad, praying is bad, serve the devil. And um, Thursday in class, he um, he started waving his arms and calling up dark spirits and demons. Now, I know how to fight this battle, but what, what I, I would like to ask is, if people could pray, this is an innocent little four-and-a-half-year-old boy, and she's twisting his mind. And the state won't help. Daddy's eyes are glazed over. Mama is just kind of... And um, you can feel, you can literally feel the power of darkness trying to pull this little boy. He wants this little boy. Right. Um, First of all, um, let's consider one thing here. Um, Fortunately, the little boy is four years old. So he's still in in what's known as the age of accountability. Have you heard of that before? Caller, have you heard of the age of accountability? Yes, I have. Okay. So, you see, he's still under God's divine protection. Okay? Oh, um, yes. Right. Okay. Now, um, which means at this point, he's not demonically possessed. What What you need to do, um, I want you to consider the situation here. Um, I believe you said it's a 16-year-old mother, correct? No, it's a 16-year-old aunt. It's the mother's okay. little sister. Okay. What you need to do is sit that kid down, as I'm sure it um, it has been done, but um, reiterate and reinforce um, the si- the good side. God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, teach him. You're going to have to start showing him now. It's a little early, but it seems like you better do it now before you'll hate yourself later. Start teaching him why those other things of, of an occult nature are very bad. How they yeah. will, Now, remember, you've got to explain this on his terms. That's why I said explain to him that it's bad, that bad people go to hell, and that, you know, good people don't touch these things, and show him in the Bible why. Now, you have to address this, remember, as I said, on his level. Right. Okay? Right. And what you also need to do also, pray over the little one. And oh. um, right, but and when I say pray, uh, what I was about to say is also make sure that um, you pray that nothing demonic will ever be able to communicate with this child. Okay, well, thank you for that call. I mean, that is very important that we really need to be <clears throat> praying over our families. I mean, using anointing oil, covering with the blood of Jesus. That's very important, especially in this this time that we live in, and I really appreciate that particular question. God bless that little boy. It's really tragic when we hear of stories like this. It's just heartbreaking. Area code 727. I'm just going to go. I'm not even going to do the break because we've got so many callers. It's unbelievable. 727, welcome to the program. What's your question for Doc? Hi. I have two quick questions. I hear I that the question. Illuminati... I have um, one question. The... What's your name? Okay. <laughs> All right. What's your name? Um, where are the Napoleons well, now? If they're on Earth, they're not giants. Do you, uh, I can't make that connection. First of all, hon, what's your name? Marie. Hi, Marie. Now, Nephilims, okay? Um, yes, if we go by the Hebrew translation, there was two words in particular, um, um, Nephil and Rafa. Both words are denoted to mean something that's huge, something that's big. In our language, we would say, my goodness, that's huge or that's giant, correct? Yeah, she's taking it off air, Doc. Oh, okay. So you see, um, this is where the word Nephilim is derived from. Now, we must understand that um, (coughs) a lot of people are saying that, well, the earth is going to be covered with Nephilims, um, at the end. Well, that's not what the Bible says. You see, 
And they get this from using two particular um, passages of Scripture. One is in Matthew chapter 24, where it says, As it was a day in the days of Noah, so shall, I, so shall it also be with the coming of the Son of Man. And then, I believe it's in the book of Luke, where it says, As it was in the days of Lot. Now, there's a practice um, that's taught in every single Bible college and university. It's known as homonutics. Homonutics is a biblical practice in which whatever um, is in the passage stays in proper context. You cannot add or subtract from it. It is what it is. Now, when we go to those two passages in particular, the topic of discussion was the rapture. It was not um, about giants. There's nothing even in those passages that you could even infer. It's talking about giants. It was never mentioned in any of those verses. Yet these people are saying that's what it's talking about. Well, that is not um, um, proper according to biblical hermeneutics. They're not keeping the passages in context. They insert what they want to insert and say, well, this is what it really means. Well, that's not what it's saying. So, and if we look at the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, which clearly describes the end times during the tribulation period, there's not one mention of giants. So, no, there are no giants as far as biblical hermeneutics goes and as far as a prophecy goes, that will be around during the tribulation period. Okay, I have a question for you from a, a, an email here. If you wish to answer this, Doc, have you been approached or asked by current Illuminati members on how to accept Jesus to change their course of history or destiny? Okay, uh, I can answer that in, I have to answer that in two passions. One, um, those who have tried to kill me in the past, a number of them, okay, um, in, the, in the first 10 years, shall we say, a number of them had physically tried to come up to me and kill me. Well, I have, first of all, two things on my side. One is God. And that's enough right there. If God says, um, it's, not my, from, from, it's not my time to go, then I'm going nowhere. But second of all, back then, I was a lot younger, and um, I have a black belt in Shaolin Kung Fu. <laughs> okay, that's your protection, huh? <laughs> uh, well, it used to be. I'm a lot older now, and I don't move as fast as I used to. Okay. But um, in either case, um, um, if, um, uh, I was completely, completely relying on God. Now, as far as um, other people in the Illuminati do get them out, yes. Um, we have managed to get out a number of other people in the Illuminati, and I'm not at liberty to say who, how, or why. I mean, the why, I, I mean, it's easy, but I can't explain the rest of it, because it would give away what we're doing. But okay. I can tell you this much. Um, a number of them, by the grace of God, have left, and, and they leave um, as born-again children of God. Wonderful. That is very impressive. 309, welcome to the program. What is your question for Doc tonight? And please turn down your radio. Okay. Three oh nine, what is your question? Yes. Uh could you talk about the Georgia Guidestones and their new little itty bitty stone that says twenty fourteen on it? <laughs> right. Good question. Okay, okay, I'm gonna actually. Well, I'm, just, I'm gonna take that um, off there, caller, because I'm getting a lot of static. But actually, that was a question I got emailed to as well, Doc. So yes, please do uh, humor us. Okay, um, I was shooting the Georgia Guidestones a number of years ago when we created DVD seven and eight in my series. That one's called um, the Illuminati's Plans for 2012 and Beyond. Um, the Georgia Guidestones um, supposedly was. Um, paid for um, by a mysterious unknown individual known as R.C. Christian, okay? And um, the Guidestones, um, there's, let me say, 10 major um, megalithic blocks there, and one of them in particular has um, what some people refer to as uh, um, New Ten Commandments, 
Um, the first one calls for a reduction of the world's population down to half a billion. Now, that alone right there told me it was not Illuminati. The Illuminati plans calls for the reduction of the Earth down to one-third of the present population. Um, the Earth is a huge place. There's a lot of machinery that has to be operated, and you're just not going to be able to run everything the way it is right now with only half a billion people. It's not going to work. There's too much infrastructure and everything else, especially technological advances in computers and other areas, that we need more than half a billion people to keep everything going. That's just, you know, long and short of it right there. Well, so but, where, um, where do you think they came from then? Who is behind the Jersey uh, guys? As far as my understanding, the truth of it, it would have been erected by the Rosicrucians. The, the Rosicrucians, okay. Yes. Which is a very questionable group as well. I mean, they're... Well, interesting enough because it was paid for supposedly by a man na- named R.C. Um, Christian, right? Right. Um, the, uh, um, the original founder was Christian Rogen Kronz. Christian, the Asi would have been the Rose Cross or the Rosicrucians. Well, why haven't we mowed those down with a bunch of backhoes? What are they still doing in Georgia? Um, it's an interesting anomaly, and a lot of people actually go see it. When I was yeah. filming there on the Guide Zone, <clears throat> um, me and my director, Corey, we um, had to stop shooting quite a number of times because of all the people that was coming back and forth to see it. Well, I'm going to take 530 area code, and then I've got another question for you from an emailer. 530, welcome to the program tonight. What is your question? Doc, this is John. John, how you doing? You promised me if I would call in the next time you're on the show, we could talk about the rapture. Okay. What would you like to talk about? Talk about the rapture. Talk about I know, but you're going to have to be a lot more specific than just that. <laughs> that could take up a week. Is your question around the pre-trib, post-trib? What's your question, sir? Let's go with the pre-trib. Okay. Well, okay, I'll actually, um, I'm going to um, fire okay, a question um, in here. Too. Can I just say, Doc, that that is probably one of the biggest questions that Doug and I and many others get is, you know, there's a lot of people on the pre-trib fence. There's a lot of people in the mid-trib fence. And there's a lot of people that talk about the post, you know. So, I mean, that is really something we definitely have to have some major debate on of a panel on a bunch of pastors because nothing boils my blood more than this fight. So I'd love to hear your take on it. Well, interesting enough, I've got a DVD coming out at the end of October. It should be around the end of October, according to my director, because it's in the post-production process right now, called... Which rapture are we waiting for? And um, so I don't take up um, any real time right now on a debate that everyone is going to, you know, may may be inflamed about. (laughs) Um, um, Go to my website um, and look in the section that's called It's in the Bible. In that section, there's an article called um, The Rapture. Read it. Now, I will caution you. Um, I didn't mean for it to be as long as it was, but I really needed to cover the whole of it. And um, it's 24 pages long. But um, going back to that DVD for a section, um, do you know um, David um, Schnitzker over at um, Southwest Radio Bible Ministries? Yeah, I'm I'm vaguely familiar with him. Okay. He wrote um, um, an endorsement for that um, coming um, DVD. He called it the magnum opus of all rapture explanations, if you can believe it. Wow. Well, so when is that released again, Doc? It's, it should be ready, according to my director, at the end of October. Well, good, now, because we're going to have to have a de- big debate. <laughs> no, no. You see... Um, we have what's known as um, a scientific method, um, what's known as a scientific method, in which we um, can prove if a fact is a fact is a fact. Now, going by the scientific method, um, under the same conditions, the same results must be yielded. This way, we know through repetition, whatever happens is a fact. 
It's going to happen like that all the time, no matter what. Do you know that there is a definitive pattern in the Holy Scriptures that tells, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's actually pre-trib? Now, a lot of people are going to jump up and down and say, no, it's mid, no, it's post. Um, well, by the way, mid-tribulation has been um, replaced by um, the wrath of God now. You know, some people say, well, this is um, the wrath. You know, oh, fine, call it whatever you want. Right. But um, the fact of the matter is, most people get the rapture completely wrong because they don't even know what makes a rapture a rapture. I mean, let me ask you the same question I've asked literally hundreds, if not thousands, of our brothers and sisters. The question is, Sheila, what is a rapture? Well, it's interesting because, you know... No, I no, no, don't give me a dissertation. Answer the question. <laughs> what is a rapture? Well, you'd think it's a, a taking out. A, a taking out. That's what, when I study out that word. It's a removal. Okay. Um, that's one of the definitions of it. Now, it's interesting. When we go to the Greek, um, in the New Testament, there's, um, I believe it's 11 passages with 17 mentions of the word um, hapezo, which is, which is the, um, we translate into the, ra- into the Latin, which is the word rapio, which when we translate into the King's English, is rapture. Now, problem is, that's not close enough, hon. That's not even good enough. Well, see, isn't it true, though, that wait, the let word me finish, rapture... Let me wait, wait, let okay, me finish. Okay, okay. A rapture is, is so simple to understand that even the apostles, and the apostles were the only ones appointed by God who had the authority to make a doctrine a doctrine. They didn't even make the rapture a doctrine. It was so straightforward, so simple, they said anyone will understand this. A rapture is based upon three and only three little concepts. God physically removes those whom he declares to be righteous outside of his impending judgment. That's it. There's nothing more to a rapture than God physically removing those whom he declares to be um, righteous outside of his impending judgment. Now, when we take the understanding of what constitutes a rapture applied to the scriptures, there is beyond any shadow of a doubt a definitive pattern that not only screams of pre-tribulation, but there are literally, I don't even know, I don't even remember how many different examples in the Old Testament alone in which there were raptures in the past. But it's because we don't recognize what makes a rapture a rapture that there is all this confusion and division. And this is why, among other things, the debate rages on. Believe it or not, now, a lot of people will say, well, this was the invention of John Darby when, right. um, in 1861 after Martin McDonald had her vision. Well, that's a lie to begin with. You see, Margaret McDonald, in 1830, a young girl of Scottish-Irish descent, did uh, supposedly have these visions. But, and here's a big but, ladies and gentlemen, you're not being told the whole of what she said. Those people who present the post-tribulation rapture either don't know the whole of the story or they're outrightly lying. Because when you put in the whole... <clears throat> of what she stated in her vision, there's no doubt of it, there's absolutely no doubt, her visions were post-tribulation, not pre-tribulation. So it was not in 1830 where um, supposedly um, pre-tribulation rapture began. Second of all, it was not John Darby who stole the idea and came up with the word rapture. That's another lie. In this new DVD, I can conclusively prove, and I created a reverse timeline from today's date, going all the way back to the time of Christ himself. We go through all the ancient literature, not all of it, but I used literally dozens, and I mean, ladies and gentlemen, dozens of ancient texts, the original texts, to prove 
if you follow this timeline all the way backwards to the time of Christ, every single one of those ancient texts always stated it was pre-tribulation, never mid, never post. And... There was, and part of the challenge I've always put to people, you create that type of same reverse timeline and show me it's post and mid, and they'll never be able to do it. Because if you've read the ancient text, as I have, and I've read all the, uh, most of the ancient texts that I can think of, um, they always spoke of pre. Never once did they ever say mid or post. It never was mentioned until... Margaret McDonald in 1830, when her visions said it was post, not pre. But there's also, a, um, as far as the, word, um, the origin of the word rapio goes, ladies and gentlemen, that's so easy. Um, just go back to, um, what is it, 323 A.D., when um, rapio was used in the Latin translation of the Bible. The word rapio is the word for, rap uh, for rapture. It's in the Bible, the Latin translation. And a lot of people will say, well, the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. Actually, it does. But second of all, the word Bible doesn't appear in the Bible. Does that mean suddenly the Bible is not the Bible because that word is not in it? Well, I guess That's the whole point... Yeah, I guess the whole you point know? is if you don't have a ticket, you'll never get on no matter what time the bus leaves, right? So be prepared yeah, at any know, time. So the whole of the crux of the DVD is to show the whole of the truth. Using all the, you know, using all the ancient literature I had used, to prove to you that there was a definitive pattern there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is, whether you believe what's in my DVD or not, what matters is, if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. Yeah, amen, That because really that is the <laughs> quintessential piece of that, and I think people need to stop nitpicking. The t I mean, obviously the time is kind of irrelevant if God says no man knoweth the hour. So uh, we, I, I just cannot get over the... One, one thing quickly. Um, the reason this division happened is the same reason um, the Illuminati um, had created all the different perversions of the um, Bible, you know, the different translations, so that it could keep us divided. You see, one of the greatest tricks... Satan ever pulled on God's kids was when he created denominational titles. Right. You see, if you belong to this denomination, well, you can't be one of us. You, you belong to that. Or, well, no, I'm sorry, I can't see things your way. You're of this religion, or, um, you, know, or, or, you, you know, whatever. You know what? And this is why I don't take on a denominational title. Because once you do, you set up denominational walls. Good point. Well, let's try to get yeah. back to some phone lines because we've got a half an hour in the program. Okay, wait, wait. Let, one, last, one last thing. You see, this is an old military ploy called divide and conquer. Keep the Christians separated and arguing by the nomination title. Keep them separated and arguing by um, creating um, more than 100 different versions of the Bible. Keep them divided and arguing about pre and post or mid, <coughs> and Satan wins because we are not together as a united family fighting for the souls of men. That is a very good point. Okay, well, let's get back to phone lines. Area code 330. Welcome to the program. What is your question? Area code 330. What is your question? Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I was talking to my dog. Uh, hey, Doc. You were talking I, I, to who? I was talking to my little Rosie here before I realized I was online here. Well, on I would phone. prefer you talk. Well, hon, I would prefer you talk to me. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Uh, listen, hey, Doc. I have a, a comment for you, and if you could tell me something, I live around uh, three Masonic temples here. I mean, they're very close together. I just recently noticed, one's across the uh, hospital. I just recently noticed they put out this huge, on both buildings, they put out this huge, uh, their symbol, you know, the Masonic symbol, and then uh, right next to it. 
Yes, yeah, and then right next to it, they put out a five-pointed star that yeah, has... That's the, uh, yeah, that's the Eastern star. That's the right. female auxiliary group of the Masons. Okay, yeah, they just put all this stuff outside the building. These buildings have been there for years. And uh, I was just wondering if you commented on that. My my thoughts were, oh, yeah, they're out in the open, and they want people to know. I mean, you well, know. With well, all... we put them out like, they're, like that, hon, because, among other things, they're recruiting. You see, right. now, they're not supposed to proselytize or recruit. And, you know, they're not supposed to do that. But right. I can tell you from past experience, three times Masons, who obviously didn't know who I were, was, yeah. you know, came up to me and asked me if I would like to become part of the Masonic Lodge. Yeah, yeah. We have a yeah, lot of that around where I live, in Akron, Ohio. Let me tell yeah, you, well, there is a lot. They're, re they're recruiting, hun. That's exactly oh. what they're doing by putting out. Yeah. They're saying, Masons are welcome here, the Eastern Stars welcome here, and you can join. That's what they're oh. doing. I'll be darned. And I have to tell you this very quickly. Uh, my thoughts about the Antichrist would be a Sabbatean. I've been studying that. I've been studying a lot of things, you know, from CERN all the way around the board. You know, everything is interconnected. And I'll tell you what, you cannot stop connecting the dots. It's a never-ending connecting dots. But um, why I say the Sabbatean, because they're Jewish and Muslim. You know, from from back when, and you know, uh, upon with the uh, Kabbalah, you know, where it all started with the Kabbalah. Now, right. they had, he, the Sabbatean has the Jewish heritage, and it's always con and they're connected with the Kabbalah. So <laughs> that that's where I see that coming from. Uh, okay. You know, I could I could sit and talk all night. You know, I mean, with everything that's going and on. And supposed to. I'm supposed to be doing that. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that. Uh, we want to get through to some other calls, too. So um, I'm going to take area code 765. Welcome to the program tonight. You're on the air. Yeah. That's... Excuse me. Hello? Am I on? <laughs> yes. I had a question yes, you for are. Doc. Yes. Uh, um, it, it, it goes to deal with a bloodline with a Rothschild and with present day with somebody that had ties their family lineage connected with Hitler or actually uh, uh, connected with Joseph Mengele. Anyways, there was a person I come across helping, and they've got a long lineage with this. They're not, American names, not that, but they're connected. Do you have any take on that? Or is is well, there anything to that? Um, well, as far as Hitler being um, connected to the Rothschild, actually he is. He's from their bloodline. A lot of people don't know that, historically speaking, about Adolf Hitler, but he is related to the Rothschild family. Yeah, yeah. And it's the Rothschild family right now that heads the order of the Illuminati. Um, right now, let me think, the eldest son is Evelyn de Rothschild. Um, so Evelyn de Rothschild, he's the head of the order of the Illuminati. And in my day and age, that would have been Baron Philippe de Rothschild. But there's no doubt of it. Um, Hitler was... Um, related to the Rothschild family. Yeah, that's that's very good information for us, and thank you for clarifying. That was some of the emails, too. Area code 772, what is your question tonight for Doc? Welcome to the program. Hi, thank you, Doc and Nashu. I, have, um, I was looking at the Walt Disney uh, film you were talking about, and I never knew that. But I have a question. I don't know if you could answer it or not. I, I was looking at the logo of some of the other ones, and there are people, like they're on steps, and I took my answer offline. Could you tell me who, what that represents? People on steps, hon? I have no idea what we're talking about. Okay. okay. I mean, I, I need are more you? than people on steps to go by here. Yeah, I don't know what the question is. People. Yeah, there's some people that are on each side. There are six people. There are three on each side, and there is... If you look at the, the, the top with the flag, if you if you just they got the people there on some of them, and then they take the people away, and all you see is like the gaps in between the flags, but they're actually people's legs that are coming down those steps. Hun, you're gonna have to send me um, that picture. Um, 
if you want, send it to my email. It's docmarkey777 at yahoo.com. Okay? Okay. But right that now, I have good. no idea what, what picture you're talking about. Well, speaking of steps, one of the questions I have is what – uh, can can Doc please get into the symbolism around the Washington Monument and also what is it with the 33 steps? And then I don't know what it's the, the rest is illegible. So um, do you have any comments on some of the Well, I'm not sure what 33 steps we're talking about unless they're talking about masonry. But with the Washington Monument, that is interesting, very interesting. You see, um, um there is um, above ground 555 feet exactly. That makes up the Washington Monument. Now, a lot of people mistakenly um, converts that over to inches. Um, and as I recall, I think that comes out to be, um, oh, what is that? 600, no, 6,660 inches. Well, that's not what it's referencing. You see, you're close, but you're not dead on. <clears throat> As I stated, there's 555 feet above ground. But what most people don't realize is that um, most obelisks were built on a 1 to 6 ratio. In other words, a sixth of it would be in the ground, so it would be stable. Um, and I checked with um, um, one of the tour guides there. There is exactly 111 feet of the of the obelisk that is built underground. So 111 and 555 feet is 666 feet exactly. And that mm. obelisk makes up part of the occult symbols that connect directly to lot 666, if you remember we had already mentioned. Right. Interesting. Right. Now, the well, obelisk yeah, but... itself, the obelisk itself, is actually a giant heliocentric sun calendar. You see, it works as a sundial. Now, if you look at the one in, um, let's do, let's just say in um, the Vatican Square, that is what's known as um, Cleopatra's needle. Now. It, look at the um, symbol itself, and you have to reference Vatican City or Vatican Square. You're going to see that has eight sets of double lines around it. Now, in the occult world, there's eight times, I mean, and I'm talking about in most of the occult religions, including the Illuminati, there's eight times in which human sacrifice is a must. It's, there's no if and buts or anything about it. It's a must. Now, there are eight sets of double lines that surround the obelisk in front of the Vatican. Whenever the shadow of the obelisk falls in between any one of those sets of double lines, it's time for a human sacrifice. That, as I said, is a giant heliocentric sundial. That's the secret behind the obelisk. It was used to measure time. And among other things, in the occult world, it was used to measure sacrificial times. Okay, well, speaking of sacrificial, I've got lots of these emails. What is Doc's take on the whole Bohemian Grove situation? Uh Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, I could spend forever on this. Um, Before I do, just so you can see the whole of it, because this is going to be another one of those. It's two DVDs, four hours long. Um, DVD 11 is called Dark Rites and Rituals at the Bohemian Grove. You can see it on my website. Um, it, um, at, it's, a, it's a God Thing Production, 777.com. Go there, look in the DVD sections. You'll see Dark Rites and Rituals at the Bohemian Grove. Now, a lot of people have asked me, is that um, an Illuminati thing? Oh, yes. Oh, I can tell you right now, from my day and age in the Illuminati, that is what I always call the Illuminati summer camp. It was uh, <laughs> taken over by the Illuminati shortly after it was started. Um, and the intro, one of the um, things people always ask me about, is there an owl there? What's with the owl? Well, there is in the very hot of the Bohemian Grove itself, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> a 40-foot owl that um, the people are worshipping at. 
there is definitely um, an occult and a spe- specifically um, um, an Illuminati ritual that is being performed there every summer. It's known as the cremation of care. Now, what I did, among other things, I took the um, the uh, ceremony, the wording um, verbatim of the creation of care ceremony, and I deciphered it um, line by line in that DVD so I could prove conclusively, and I show you step by step, how beyond any shadow of a doubt, that is a genuine Illuminati ritual that they're performing. Um, there's no doubt of it. Once you go through that section in those DVDs alone, you will find out there's no doubt it is genuine. It's Illuminati. It is one of their main ancient rituals. But um, wow. among other things, these are some of the most powerful power brokers in the world that's meeting there. We're talking um, presidents, senators, um, princes, um, prime ministers, premiers, all over the world, businessmen, industrialists, all meeting there and shaping the course of human history. Um, they choose presidents there, among other things. They have um, um, started and created some of the most um, secretive projects in human history. One of the uh, big projects that come from um, the Bohemian Grove was the Manhattan Project. You remember that, Sheila, the Manhattan Project? Yes, I do. Um, and then there was the Star War Initiative under Ronald Reagan. That was started there at the Bohemian Grove. There is so much going on there, ladies and gentlemen. That's why it took me two DVDs in four hours just to explain some of it. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the phone line, 704 area code. Welcome to the program. What is your question for Doc? Good evening. 704, yeah, go ahead. Hi there. Hi there. Glad you're on tonight, uh, both of you. It's great. But thinking about this pre-trib rapture, and um, if we're out of here before a major uh, SHTF, um, how how much worse will it have to be than it already is, uh, according to Matthew 24 and, and Jesus' words about um, about the time of the end, and and there's going to be some martyrs, uh, according to the word. Um, and how is all this? How is all this going to play out, Doc? Um, well, okay. Let's answer this by what you um, asked. How how much worse is it going to be? Um, well, for us, before the tribulation period hits. It's still it's going to get a lot worse than what it is. Now, as far as in the pre in the tribulation itself, it's going to be so bad. Let's not forget there's a passage in Revelation that completely states that people are going to be running to the mountains, hiding in the caves, and begging for the mountains to fall upon them so that they can die. But death will not be allowed to consume them at that point. That's how bad it's going to be. People are begging to die. Now, the martyrdom is is on a horrific scale. Um, Sheila and I, um, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, before I get into this. Few times, very, very few times in this life have I ever started a conversation with a person I had no idea about, let alone known who they were, and felt as if I'd known them for 50 years. She was one of those people. I could sit down, and she and I, we're going to pick up, Lord Will, in one of these days when we meet for the first time, we're going to be talking as if we've known each other um, our entire lives. That's how I feel about Sheila. This is the first time I've ever done a show with her. You know, I, I didn't know her from Adam, as the old expression goes, but I can tell you right now, that's how comfortable I felt um, when Sheila and I was talking earlier. But <clears throat> to get back to what we were saying, the martyrdom is going to be rampant. It's going to be worldwide. Revelation 20, um, verse 4 tells us 
that people um, are going to be beheaded because they witness for Christ. Now, there is beyond any shadow of a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, um, an, um, an insidious part of the Illuminati plan that's going on right now in front of your eyes. And um, Lord willing, um, for those of you who have listened to me before, you know what I'm about to say. We have concentration camps or POW camps. Some people want to call them FEMA camps. Call them whatever you want. Um, a number of the signs, and I provide, again, the photographic evidence. I will show you the truth. Um, we have almost 1,000 POW camps that are that's fully built, um, fully operative in the United States of America right now. They don't hold anyone. Um, we also know, and I, I, again, uh, throughout my DVD series, ladies and gentlemen, um, in DVD 6, I will show you um, um, the FEMA coffins. Literally, I, um, there's one picture, in, um, one picture in particular. I, I put it, I think it was in that one, DVD 6. That one's called um, The Illuminati is Fulfilling Bible Prophecy, in which just in one photo, there's a field that contains approximately one million FEMA coffins. These coffins can hold approximately six people apiece. And um, among other things, um, you look at these photos. These concentration camps, you will see the double barbed wire is facing inside, not outside. Now, my question is, why do we have, and mind you, I do have um, documents from Congress and other places that verify the existence of these um, concentration camps and what their purpose is. My question is, why do we have a thousand concentration camps? Why do we have literally millions upon millions of FEMA coffins and don't even get me started? on the um, guillotines, the portable guillotines that are being shipped um, throughout the United States on UN, United Nations, um, 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 trains. Why do we have so many concentration camps if we don't have any war going on in the United States? Unless they're planning to cause some sort of war to happen on the United States. You see, mm, concentration camps, that, by definition, concentration camps or a POW camp is meant to house prisoners. Right. Guess who the prisoners, ladies and gentlemen, are going to be in the near future? It's going to be people like me, Sheila, and others who are, bl who are whistling, uh, what, what is the term, whistleblower, whistleblowing the truth. Anyone who dares to stand up against the government, anyone who dares to speak out about salvation of Jesus Christ, that's what those places are for. But I can tell you also, ladies and gentlemen, um, many of those POW camps um, um, can literally execute um, up to at least 50,000 people a day. I know. Yeah, I saw one of the first concentration camps built in America and that was in the middle of the Mojave Desert and I saw that back in um, 76. That's really Auschwitz on steroids, isn't it, that concept? I'm sorry, what was that? So that sure. really is Auschwitz. Yeah, that's a Auschwitz yeah. on steroids, isn't it? Yes, that's exactly what it is. You see, <clears throat> let me explain something here. Most people may not understand. The Illuminati never do, never do anything on a large scale until they've done it on a smaller scale first. That's why they created the Nazi regime. They experimented there. They um, tried everything in the book to see if and how it would work. It came out flawlessly. And ladies and gentlemen, if you think Obamacare with all its regulations, is a new thing, then you don't know your history. Because, you see, Hitler had his own, shall we say, Obamacare. It was known as T4. It was a secret yeah. project 
under Adolf Hitler himself. You look at T4 compared to Obamacare, it's almost the exact same thing. Uh, all that, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you want to look at, um, compare Obama's regime to um, Adolf Hitler, um, I just released not too long ago DVD 13 in the series. It's called Dictators of the Illuminati. You've got to look at that one. Um, most of the stuff I've got in there about Barack Obama, his past, and other things, um, I've had, um, I test drove this. Most people told me they didn't know half of what they just learned about Obama in that DVD. And I mean the truth about this guy. But, um, oh yeah, let me tell you right now. Um, the Illuminati, after they try something on a small scale, then they'll bring it up to the large scale. And that's why, and that's why, and that's what they're doing in the United States of America right now. You are seeing the reemergence by any other name of the Nazi regime in America right now. Learn the history of Nazi Germany and you'll better understand what's going on in America right now. Wow. Okay. Well, five eight zero five eight zero. Welcome to the program. What is your question for Doc? Hey Sheila. First, let me say that I, I really appreciate you uh, stepping in on the show. I always enjoy your conversations, particularly on the weekend. My question for Doc is that you know I, I have a friend. He's my best friend. He's been a friend since second grade. I trust him with my life. He's a Mason. He, his great-grandfather was a Mason, his grandfather was a Mason, all the way down the line, and it, his son has recently joined the Lodge. And and we talk about this stuff quite frequently, and and, and he is informed. He, he understands the uh, um, different things that are associated with that, knows a lot about the Illuminati, uh, and I believe him to be a good Christian man. He's a Quaker as well. And when Lord Doug talks about the lie being different at every level, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, I don't know. I Sometimes I, I know the person, and I look at them, and I have a hard time believing that, you know, he is part of this cult as it is described. What what would you say to that? Okay, I can understand your hesitancy. Because, yeah, you see, one thing is, um, let let me just make a quick comparison. Would you say George Washington was an evil man? He's The, the caller is off there now, Doc. Okay, well, Sheila, would you say um, George Washington was an evil man? Off the top of my head, I would say that that's debatable. <laughs> well, actually, he wasn't. He was a God-fearing man. And um, right. by all accounts and um, historicities, he was also a good man. But at the same time, he was a Mason. He was a third-degree Mason. He made it all. He was in the Blue Lodge, the first three degrees. The entered apprentice, the, uh, and the accepted apprentice, and then the Master Mason. So he was a Master right. Mason. Now, um... Most Masons, 95% of them, haven't a clue what's going on within their own temple. They don't. It's only once you get to the 33rd level that you know the full truth of what's going on in the Masonic Lodge. Now, one thing um, to your last caller, I would, I would question your friend about. You see, Masonic writings, and again, this is in DVD 4. I will show you every single book. I will quote the passage, the page, the author, everything. Most, uh, so many of the passages in the Masonic books talks about that the only way these people can get to heaven is through being faithful Masons and following the teachings of Masonry. This is how they claim a person gets to heaven. This is their own writings now. They never say salvation is found in Jesus Christ. They never say that Jesus Christ died for your sins so you could go into heaven. The fact of the matter is, the writings of the Masons completely state, if 
anyone mentions the name of Jesus Christ during any of their ceremonies, they're to be taken out of the lodge immediately and killed. Their version of getting to heaven, and again, um, to your caller, Sheila, I swear by this, in the Masonic books, now this is in DVD 4, Magic, Mysticism, and Masonry, they state the only way to heaven is by following the teachings of Masonry. Now that completely contradicts that word of God and all the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now I would ask your friend, whoever that last caller was, ask your friend how, according to Masonic teachings, do you get to heaven? They will not tell you it's through the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you and I both know that's straight from the Bible. That's straight from the Word of God. That tells us how we're going to get to heaven. Take the gift of salvation. Ask your friend about that. Ask him this question, how does a Mason get to heaven? Don't go beyond that. Just ask him, how according to Masonic teachings does a person get to heaven? And judge for yourself when they tell you it's through their teachings and not through the teachings of Jesus Christ. I would make your decision upon masonry after that. Okay, well, I'm going to take some more, a couple more calls before the end of the program. And interestingly, I have three calls from the area code 267. Uh, so I'm going to take 267-385. Oh. Welcome to the program tonight. You're on the air. Hello. Hi, Sheila. It's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. What's your question? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, what is the connection with Freemasonry in Philadelphia? This is where I live, and uh, we have the Christ First Church on Delaware Avenue, and it seems like the, the Freemason, uh, they got like a temple down there off of, uh, I think it's Broad Street. There's a, I think there's a, uh, some sort of connection. I just wanted to ask Doc if you knew anything about that. Okay, I'll, we'll ask him. Okay, um, it could very well be that there's a high concentration there because, you see, a lot of the letters um, um, from Albert Pike, the um, head of the Southern Jurisdiction of Masonry during the, eight, during the um, mid to the late 1800s, a lot of the letters of Albert Pike was held in a Philadelphia um, museum. So that could that it could be that reason alone why there's a heavy concentration of masonry there because those letters would have been considered sacred to them. Well, I might as well follow suit and take the next two six seven. Maybe they're from Philly too. Welcome to the program <coughs> two six seven five nine six. You're you're on the air. Yeah, how you doing? This is Eric. You can hear me. Hi, Eric. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, just been following the show. I got cut off a little earlier. Um, was interested in uh, talking about um, the alien situation, and um, I had a I had a few things to mention. Um, my grandfather lived in Puerto Rico, and he said um, off of a naval base that there'll be a tribe of of like drone, not drones, uh, domes, gnomes. There you go, the gnomes little short people that right. they come off, uh, yeah, there's certain base at night and, you know, they used to go around there, go swimming at night and, and, and the bushes and, uh, these, this tribe of gnomes will follow you wherever you're at. Like they're little people. Um, I don't want to say they're little grays, but, um, they're well known up there in Puerto Rico and, um, well, yeah, you know, hold on, Eric. Let me explain something quickly. You see, we go throughout history, various cultures and um, communities throughout the world. We find out that there are various stories of mythological creatures that are short, that um, appear out of nowhere, and supposedly they're advanced or they have magical powers and things like that. And this is the same explanation we're getting with the little grace. Okay, well, he's off air now, and there's a good movie title, Gnomes, Drones, and Clones. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's, go to the, let's go to the next caller. Uh, I don't know who this is. It says restricted, but welcome to the program. I think you might be calling in from Skype. What is your question? You, 
California. Hello. Yeah, California. From California. Yep, California. Go go ahead. You're oh, on. Oh, I just one one question. Make it brief. Uh, work. My wife, she's a charismatic Catholic, and uh, she always mentions about John Paul II. Why was he taken out if he was involved in you know the you know the plan with the Antichrist? And uh, there's a lot of charismatics that are. I don't think they're involved in in Masonic uh, you know beliefs. And uh, also, there is a, a FEMA camp. I think a, a prison being built. East of Yuma, it's already built there, and one east of us here on the border, Mexico and California. But getting back, well, to, if you could get photo, if you could get photos of that, send it to me. I'll put it with the rest of them. I'm um, just telling the location, you know, the city, uh, the state. This way, I can add it to the archives and show everyone what's going on here. Now, as far as John Paul II being murdered, or if that's what I understand, I never, under- I never understood that he was bumped off or anything. Interesting. Wow. Well, I, I know I, one I particular been... pope. Um, um, I can't remember his name. He um, reigned only for thirty-three days. Um, right. He was the right. shortest reigned pope in history. I think that was in the mid fifties, um, or was it? No, it could have been the seventies, early seventies or early late sixties. What had happened? That particular pope, um, he was actually going to clean house. He he found out about the huge um money laundering that was being done through the Vatican through the um through the um mafia then um through the Illuminati and he was gonna blow the whistle on the whole thing. He was literally cleaning house. He had already kicked out a number of papal um um priests in certain position and everything. And what had happened, um the man I believe he was on digitalis for a heart condition. Um and he had been on this medication for years. Now, the story goes that um, he accidentally took an overdose and died. Of course he did, accidentally, right? He See, accidentally poisoning <laughs> is the preferred method of the Illuminati. You see, there's an ancient practice in the Illuminati. It's known as Vesia. It comes from the Latin. It means poisoning. Um, the Illuminati are so skilled in alchemy, and I can tell you about alchemy, I learned this also. Um, When it comes to certain poison, they can keep a person on the brink of death indefinitely with certain poisons. This has always been the preferred method of execution, and when it comes to poisoning, they love to make it look like a heart attack. Well, Doc, that is fascinating, and I wanted to, I'm really sorry to all the other callers. I'm going to take one more call. Area code, let's see, area code 562. You've been holding quite a long time. What's your question? You're the final caller. Go ahead, 562. 562. Hey, how you doing, Doc? How you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, I've been a target of the Illuminati, Freemasons, all these secret societies my whole life. My family. Why? My great. Why? Well, my bloodline, I think. My great great uncle was prime minister of England, William Gladstone. My real grandfather was a banker who built Vegas for the mob. He was a Shriner Illuminati. And then my grandmother, uh, she divorced him when I was born in Nimi. You know, numbers are really important. So I'm a real 22. It's kind of the opposite of a Masonic 33. I'm a warrior for God which I didn't know until I was 40. But my question is this. Um, I think the understating thing in the country is America is, by my assessment, about 80% secret society. There's numeric language communications and everything. I made a movie called The Numeric Language on YouTube. And, you know, it's in everything. All your sports stars, 32, 9-11, all that stuff. Could you talk a little bit about the numbers I well, I want, can't but. get into the numbers um, too deeply because of um, we're running out of time. But it goes back to what I was saying, that the Illuminati will always mark their territory. You have to know um, the symbols. You have to know the correct um, numerology and gematria. But I guarantee you, if you, once you understand those, for what they really are, you will never – see, it goes back to what I tell everyone – once, if, you never, if you don't know it, you'll never see it. Once you know it, you'll never miss it. This is the heart and soul of how the Illuminati mark their territory. It's through the numbers and through the symbols. It's always been like that. Now, I get into some of this in DVD 1, that's Arrival of the Antichrist. But um, very quickly, I would say for all um, your other callers that 
um, we won't be able to get to. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to, you can call me tomorrow. I promise I'll be home. I will purposely make sure to stay home all day long tomorrow. Call me at 402-228-9476. Now that's 402 402- Two two eight nine four seven six, or if you want, you can email me at docmarkey seven 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 at yahoo dot com. That's docmarkey seven 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 at yahoo dot com. As I said, I will purposely make sure to stay home tomorrow all day long to answer your questions. Well, Doc, I just want to say, in the waning minute of the program, you are absolutely a wealth of information. Your website, again, is just stunning to me. It's just got so many incredible tools, so much incredible information. It's a God Thing Productions, 777.com. Folks, please go to the DVD streaming. You can watch incredible information there. And, you know, Doc, it's really incredible, the information you've given, and it's very 